Okay, can you all see me and hear me? Great. Okay, have a few people here, it seems. Let me just have a look at the Facebook page. So what's happening is we're live streaming it. So I'm going to see if I can somehow see what's going on in the live stream as well, just in case people have a of questions. Yep, here we are. Okay. So, well, thank you for everyone coming. Like I, like I said, I, yeah, look, I was just saying on the group, it's just amazing. I mean, this group, yeah, look, Nicholas says thanks for doing this, but I'm, Honestly, I'm actually quite blown away by what's by this group and by what um, Christine and what Jason and everyone on this group. It's like, wow, I, I seriously, like a couple of days ago, I just said to my, you know, friends and a couple of others, I just said, look, I'm living in a city of idiots. And I just said, um, I mean, I said, I know how to stand up for my rights, but everyone just wants to be slaves and they deserve it. And then I get invited to this group and I meet all these like-minded people everywhere who are like strong, who are kind of keen to do something about it, who value their businesses and freedoms and like, yeah, we're not just going to basically be some government, you know, bitch, bitch basically. And it's just really cool. So, yeah, look, legend for you guys turning up to listen. I mean, I can talk all day about this stuff and do webinars for the next three weeks. At the end of the day, if the city wakes up and we turn Perth and get it back into a really great city, we all benefit from it like every single one of it. So we all benefit, basically, if we get our city back. So what I see is this is a community effort. I mean, I'm just happened to be the guy speaking and just happened to have gone this journey because of various things. So look, I'll, I'll get started and share the format because like anything, it's good to get some order, some structure, and I've worked my ass off today to get something together because it was very organic and very spontaneous and I've always I've kept really private. My Zoom's never been particularly busy before, so I've deliberately kept it small. So we hit 97 and about to max out on our 100, so I've never had this happen before. It's quite exciting. Okay, so um, housekeeper, not sure how long it will go. I mean, I have a feeling I'm going to get a lot of questions, so may go may go for longer than that. Who knows? I've got about 60, 75 minutes of content. I've got plenty to share. and yeah, look, I'm making sure we've streamed it in the Facebook group so people who miss it, and I may upload it to YouTube as well just so people can share it around. Oh, we've got 100, 101 people. It's interesting. So look, a bit of a disclaimer, I've got to do this because I'm not a lawyer anymore. I was one. I resigned. Now, because I resigned from being a lawyer, what that now means is that I'm not allowed to give legal advice, and nor do I actually want to, to be frank with you. I much prefer to empower you to get your own strength because it's going to take 105 or a million, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 really empowered people who don't need lawyers, accountants, and don't need anyone else to basically be able to speak calmly in their truth. So I don't want to give legal advice. And what I want to do is educate you and happily share the wisdom that I've got over the years. So I mean, being a lawyer, having despised the system that I was in, um, took it on, had a few wins, had a few bad defeats and um, ended up basically eventually getting myself out of the whole thing and it was the best thing I ever did. So I'm more about helping you to become empowered and stand up for yourself without spending a fortune on a lawyer in the bar. Nothing I say constitutes nor should be relied upon as legal advice. Don't give your power up to me just because I happen to be some dude who, you know, knows a bit of shit. Um it's just, that's literally about it. I just happened to know this stuff because I was a lawyer for long enough and eventually after a while you start to know a few things and look, my attitude to life is I just give things a go. I might, my view is try everything once. If you're thinking about, you know, the reason that I beat police in courts case I was told is impossible because I thought, well, why not? You know, I only live once. I might as well go to court and worst case scenarios, I lose, I lose the, the fight and to my astonishment, I actually won it. So that was really cool. And that's really what empowerment is. You just be, get you get rid of your fears and just live beyond what's comfortable to make a difference. And, you know, learn wisdom in how you do it too is the big thing, learning wisdom. That's one of the things that I 
one of the reasons also I've refused to go to freedom rallies and get involved in a lot of awake groups is, as I think most people in them are a bunch of idiots. That's been my own observation. They, you know, they're, they're good hearted, they're keen, they're hungry, they want to do something, they end up doing in a silly way. And I only say idiots because many of them have actually said to them, look, I'll happily give you some guidance. And then they say, oh, who are you? You don't know what you're talking about. So I thought, okay, cool. Um, so like I said, if you really don't feel so powered, seek professional legal advice. So I don't know all the answers. Um, some of you probably actually know the law better than me now because I haven't been doing it six years. My one gift I can bring to the table for those who want to listen tonight, and some of you may just decide you don't, but those who do, um, really I want to share with you more the art of warfare as a lawyer, the art of war in the law, and knowing how to win a fight by focusing on what is important, not what constitutes distractions. Many people lose a fight because they focus on the wrong thing, and I've won many a fight when I should have had no chance because simply because I've known the art of war and I've known how to outwit my opponent. And that's how I worked with just about everything. That's why I've sailed through these last couple of lockdowns. If you ask me, how's my, how's my COVID experience been? And honestly, it's been really good. Life has not changed in the slightest for me. If anything, I've just got more prosperous. I've had more fun, um, enjoyed life a whole lot more and just got on with things and haven't in any way been affected by, by what's going on just because I know my rights and I know how to stand in them. I know how to do them in a wise way. So that's what I'll be teaching you more today. And then, you know, if after this, look, I think you're going to have a million more questions after this. So if you say, look, we really need some more webinars, I'll happily do it. Like I said, I'm just keen and give as much as I can. So this battle is not fought by being aggressive or angry. Um, this battle has to be fought in the legal arena and understanding the psychology and how the game works as well as the law and how everything actually works. So... You often win and sometimes you lose when you expect to win. I know it's important in the law and I just really just read directives and sometimes we get caught up with legal arguments that don't actually matter. And that's probably one thing that hopefully over this webinar or even others that I do, if, we, if I do any more of you, is just there's some legal arguments that um, people ask me and what do you think of this and what do you think of that? And it doesn't actually matter. The key is how you live your life freedom and stop governments taking over your state. It's that simple. That's all we want. You know, we don't want to be right on this. We just want to stop this shit from going on and not be run by basically just the two-thirds idiots who think it's the greatest thing in the world to be locked down and um, basically not be able to do anything. So the agenda to the night, this is probably a, a bit of a summary, um, is, yes, yeah, so what's going on in the world, psychology, order of creation, what's called legal issues and next steps. So just some quick background on me, because a lot of you probably don't even know me. Um, so if I'm going to my phone, it's just because I'm getting people messaging me about this webinar tonight. Um, so, yeah, qualified accountant, lawyer, financial planner of over 50 years experience, 10 years with the tax office, 20 years experience in private practice, um, offshore Australian tax specialist, entrepreneur, um, various businesses, invest in quite a lot of stuff, just keep life really simple. So I'm just responding to someone who fell off the webinar and probably can't get into the numbers. Um, just say go on the group. Go on the Facebook group. Yeah, so just um, I think on the Telegram group, there's people saying the same thing. So if any of the admin are listening, um, just tell them, go on Facebook group, maybe just let them know. Okay, so um, background, first class nerd, got these various qualifications, lawyer, accountant, planner, honours. The biggest thing that happened to me, I mean, I could keep you here for ages. Probably the, the main thing that I'll just throw in there about my background, that, that what I call the salient key points. So I got all these various qualifications. I also worked for the ATO, would you believe it, in 1989 to 1999. Um, so I actually worked with the government. I actually was a tax auditor. So I learned very quickly how the government realm works, which helped me a lot in becoming this kind of lawyer because I'm very familiar with various government departments and how they all work. I got involved in the underground movement when I was going through a horrendous health crisis at that time when life was shitty as heck. And... Um, I had chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, um, you know, you name it. I had a basically a, a collection of it. 
And while in that time, I ended up going into an underground movement and really learning with some of the most remarkable people in the world who had done everything from beat tax officers. I met a guy who used to be a secret agent who'd beaten every single court um, and government just about across New Zealand. He showed me a lot of his stuff. Um, I met another guy who had similar kind of results. I met people who hadn't paid taxes legally in years. They had just simply written to the tax officers and I, I, I completely was blown away. At first, they wouldn't let me in the in the circle because they assumed I was a plant because I was a lawyer. They eventually realised that I actually was sincere, so they let me let me in, and I learnt this amazing life. And that's a lot of where I got my knowledge about legal notices, how to write common law notices, how to read things, basic rights, and things like that. So, from two thousand and one to two thousand and three, various things happened. I decided to stop voting, and I just did. They tried to find me. I just hit them with. I just read the act, hit them with some legal notices about um, freedom of religion based on section 100 and something, and they immediately evade the fine, and I just got on with life and didn't vote again. So I just do what I call an energetic vote, just vote for my heart. Um, the I also stopped doing the censuses, and I use a trick which I'll show here, there, and just various stuff. I just thought, now nah, I don't want to participate in most of this stuff, and just got on with life. I had so many speeding fine and other court wins in this period here oh, you hear conspiracy theories but actually was visited by the police and very friendly mind you lovely the guy was really nice and just said you know I'm very embarrassed I'm sorry to say this to you but we've especially assigned someone to you because you can't keep winning these cases it's kind of not really that good we don't want people getting around the system and just all these amazing case wins I had just stopped happening with the same magistrate so I realised that I was out of, you know, wasn't going to work as well. Um, 2015, I walked away from law after just deciding that not for me. Um, in that time, um, no centres. I chose not to get my my sons jabbed, um, along with Grace, who's here today. Um, the homeschooled. Um, we've been doing that since 2015. They've never had jobs. Oh, she's still trying to, Deborah. Go on my personal page to tell her. Yeah, so I, I basically homeschooled my boys. They are very aware of all this kind of stuff. Um, they're all involved, three of the four are involved in businesses. Um, yeah, so eventually, yeah, look, I live what I live what I speak. I haven't made a big deal about it just because what I've generally found is that it's tough, it, as you've learned probably now with this whole lockdown shit. It's tough to basically be a free person in a world full of full of idiots. It's a bit like being the only healthy person in a leper colony. And I'm sure many of you will feel like that. I mean, if you are, just type a Y. That's kind of where you've been at. And this group's become a bit of a, like, you know, lifesaver for you, as some people have said. Um, I've had so many people say to me, like, this group's been a lifesaver for them. Like, they just about given up and, you know, thinking that anyone was awakened. And it's great when I call... You know, I'm not being religious, I say, but it's great when the army of God comes together and isn't just sitting there in their caves with their swords. So that's what I see happening here, and it's great. You know, I'm really, really grateful that people here actually want to do something about their freedom. So it's what's going on in the world. So I'm just going to, like I said, give my best shot. Generally, I've been pretty accurate only just because of my experience at underground in law. I'm into spiritual kind of psychic stuff, which I know a lot of you stuff do and do a lot of that sort of stuff myself. And it, to me, it's very simple. I always think the logical thing is what makes sense. And what seems to be the crazy is often the most logical. I said right back at the start of last year, I said, well, I said the whole thing's been the most organised, orchestrated, incredibly um, militant thing I've ever seen in my life. I said, whoever who's ever organised this whole thing is a genius in marketing, incredibly evil. I said, very smart. I said, basically, I said, I'm pretty sure we just had a communist takeover, but they're hiding it from us. So that's my summation of it. And that's what I said about a year ago. I said, we've been taken over. So I said, probably someone from Europe or group from Europe. Um, and they're probably calling the shots and they're threatening that if anyone doesn't do what they say in their little World Health Organization, there's probably going to be withdrawal of bank funding from the IMF, crash their economy, withdrawal of allies support and war. It was something as simple as that. But I said, you can tell that half these politicians just don't want to do this. I mean, I know I, I've got a lot of background in politics because um, my father was heavily 
um, it was a political analyst who used to commentate in the paper. So I was often down Parliament House having lunch, meeting the politicians. Um, I've met Mark McGowan um, in the lunchroom, um, quite a lot of them. So pretty aware. And most of them are just pretty much just puppets doing what they're told. And it's just understanding that that it's, it's, a, it's a bigger picture than you all realise. Um, it's a much bigger wall that we're in. It's This is not... It's one of these things I've learned very quickly that the better you face the, the hard truths quickly, the easier life gets rather than creating what I call a fantasy view of the world. And I think that's what I appreciate about this group here. I think people here are pretty realistic about where the world is actually right now. And I appreciate all of you for that. You're not basically sitting in fairyland in your head. And that's why, like I said, I'll, I'm happy to share whatever I've got because realistically, the basically, as I see it, the world's in real trouble. I don't think there's any other way to put it. Um, you can't have an organised, you know, bullshit pandemic come up like this. Um, and, you know, and everyone just runs for their life and shuts down and hides in their homes and not know you're in real trouble because no one's really standing up. And you just can see that rights will be pretty much taken away as people feel like it. So mass consciousness, lowest common denominator besides our government, basically. So one of the things that's very, very important to win a war like this and deal with government is your mindset and understanding the psychology of how they work. And I can remember when I used to work for the tax office as an auditor, and I was just the 21-year-old guy at the time who just had a job. I was excited. I was keen to impress my bosses. I was a fair kind of a guy. In actual fact, I overall didn't like how high taxes were, so I was tending to be, be quite a lot nicer than a lot of them. And I can remember being told by my boss I had to um, audit this guy in business for his receipts. And I, we sent him a letter. And the guy rang me and went absolutely apeshit, apeshit on the phone with me. And I remember going, I was really taken aback because it had never happened before. And I said to, and I just said to the guy, look, you know, just so you know, this isn't personal. I'm really not, um, you know, picking on you. It's just that this is just a government audit letter. It's a stand one. All you have to do is just let me see your receipts. There's not going to be a problem. I really don't want to cause you any problems. I appreciate you running a business. And he just started yelling at me even more and calling me a government Nazi. And he said, um, and he even said to me, mate, he goes, you know, you come around my house, man, I'll flop and whack you. And he just went off at me and then, and then said, don't you dare come near me and hung up on me. Now, until that point, I'd actually been wanting to help this guy and felt a bit for him, but I just went, I was furious. And I just remember going to my boss and saying, bloody, told him what he said. I said, can, what's the worst thing we can do to this piece of shit? I said, what's the worst thing we can do? And he said, well, we can hit him with a 264 notice. I said, what's that? Threaten him with instant arrest if he doesn't comply. I said, good, send him, you know, send the police around his house, do whatever it takes. I said, I will not have that, you know, piece of crap, you know, threatening me, you know, over the phone. And he goes, no, I agree with you. So we sent him, and I just said, you know, what's the worst notice and can we find the worst people to do it to him? And I was so mad and we did it. And he, he came in the office and he was bawling his eyes out and saying, look, you know, um, please, you know, why did you have to do that to me? And I, I just said, look, I really didn't want to, but you went off your face at me. And he said, look, I didn't understand. I, and we ended up being very nice to him. The point was when, uh, when we were working with him, we'd have, we'd, we had no real interest at the time. Now, in saying all that, I quickly got tired of working in the tax office. But that's the first thing I want to share with everyone. You've just got to realise that most of these cops are just normal guys or normal ladies. They've got their jobs. They've got a mortgage. They're probably not being paid what they should getting paid for the work they're getting done. That's what they probably think about it. I'd say, from what I'm observing, I think most of them are over this whole shit. Um, I was at the South Fremantle markets, and there were cops, young, young guys walking around, and people weren't wearing masks, and they were just chatting to people. Didn't even, didn't even ask them to do anything, you know. So I think there's some like anything who are enjoying the power play, but I think overall a lot of them really don't kind of stomach for it. And I, I'm the contrarian when it comes to this, and I'm sure most of you will disagree and I understand, but I think compared to other premiers, I do think Mark McGowan, he certainly, I, I was predicting, I said, I think he will be ending this as soon as he possibly can. You know, you can see he's just, you know, Someone's calling the shots, and that's the thing I really don't like. It would be a lot easier for me if I felt the politicians were the ones doing this. What concerns me is I think it's a much bigger picture and it's coming from another country. And that's why understanding the rights and the laws and getting strong in this 
may you may even be surprised to see that in many revolutions that I've listened to it in history, many of the leaders of the country end up coming on board once they realise what's going on. So it's all about how we do this and how we understand and how we stand up for rights and realise there's a much bigger picture than this. So sovereignty as it's defined means to actually pretty much have complete power over your own life, your own body and things like that. So someone else is trying to get in. Um, Yes, I think people are kind of getting caught with this um, <laughs> Zoom limit that we've got. Um, so without any interference from outside sources or bodies. So that's the key. So this is what I call the order of creation. Now, you probably, those of you who've been in common law seminars, I mean, if any of you have, just say me in the chat. But this is a mind thing more than running around yelling this at the cops. They're just not going to get what you're saying here. Um, so, yeah, God, source, man, woman who's sovereign. So that's the order of, of basically creation. In other words, that's the order. So God or source, whatever you believe God to be, created us, created man and woman. And we were made as sovereign, inviolable um, beings. And government um, essentially was created by man and by women for the purpose of organising communities and collectives. That was the basic purpose of governments. It was set up to guide men and women um, in their government. And the reason for that is the bigger communities got in the evolution of planet Earth, obviously, you can, if you've got like 100,000 people in the same region and everyone just does what they feel like, it turns into an absolute rabble. So men and women voluntarily created governments and the purpose for doing it was to give give an order and give an agreed community standard which people could actually meet. And so the general idea, as you'll see from common law, was it was just common sense is probably the best summary of common law. And so people go against what's the best for the community. They'd be dealt with severely and dealt with accordingly. And um, what we've seen come about, and this all started at, a, at the Tower of Babel back about five odd thousand years ago, when um, a guy called Nimrod, um, who you probably heard of the Tower of Babel, became by and large the first major New World Order at the time and took over the earth through war and conquest. And that was probably the first major cartel. And between him and his wife established the, the province of Babylon, which was incredibly oppressive and incredibly dark and incredibly horrible. And by and large used black magic. It did, you know, horrendous laws, um, took away people's rights and freedoms en masse set up an energy grid or centre that controlled the world, um, controlled the spiritual technology on the planet at the time. Um, yeah, all kinds of stuff. So that was the first experience of that. So what you actually end up having effectively was a cartel, so to speak. So the first major cartel. And that was like a, a small special interest group. And since that time, this has been an ongoing challenge of Earth where you've got these cartels, by and large, running the Earth um, in some parts of the Earth. I mean, other parts of the Earth, you have sovereign common law, what I call um, communities running on this true basis where they recognise the sovereignty of man and women. The ancient Hebrew community definitely worked that way. They brought in governments more to bring the right order. The law of Moses in the Bible was a good example of that. Um, and... But then, of course, in many of these places like Babylon, in Persia, in parts of Greece, in the Alexander the Great Realm, in the oppressive Roman Empire, in many of these ones, they, cartels sprung up and took over and controlled and were much more brutal and oppressive. So this is what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with just pretty much nothing new under the sun, as the wisest man on earth, King Solomon, once said. He said, there's nothing new under the sun. So we're just simply seeing it's as simple as cartels um, fighting for power. And my personal opinion, which I've never heard anyone else say, but this is just my own thing, which time will tell if I'm right. I think it's as simple as, like I said, there's been a world takeover. I think that one nasty group um, has been taken over by a nastier group. That's my summation because the previous nasty group seems to have been by and large getting put out of commission. and. The new nasty group, whoever they are, is a much more militant, 
they seem to be much more organized and they seem to have by and large pulled off this kind of major propaganda censorship defrauding of elections and controlling of basically by and large people's minds now i'm glad i can actually say all this without being labeled a, a fruitcake because i think i would on 99.97 other webinars um whereas i think probably we i would get very little disagreement on this so the thing is is the moment you um yeah alan yep totally the moment that you submit yourself under these corporations then you're stepping into that realm of persons and that's something that you probably again i'm speaking to the converted but it's good just to remind that to remember at the moment you do that you're basically under the deep state so to speak now in saying that again this is why i said i like to bring practical training to all of this it's all very well to know that the fox should not have taken over the chicken coop and started eating up the chooks it's another thing to going up and saying to the fox hey mate you shouldn't be here can we do a court hearing to deter a new and to determine whether you you and your crony should be here eating the chickens and the fox said yeah no problem me and my these other two chickens will set up a court hearing and we'll hear you out. Now, we all know what's going to happen. The, the foxes are going to simply go, okay, hear the hearing out and go, now we found we don't agree, we've got a right to be here, but just eat the chickens anyway. So it takes a deeper strategy, a deeper legal wisdom in knowing your power and knowing how to deal with this kind of stuff. And as I see it, there's levels of what I call winning this war. And... There's one level, there's the ultimate result, which is to actually get the full legal system and get the government back where it should be under a proper common law, a proper system where people have got their freedoms while still maintaining an excellent order of government to have a high community standard. So people can't decide if they feel like being a pedophile or they can, if they think they want to have their freedom to do sex trafficking. So they're extreme examples, but to make a point, we all, anyone who's half, half, you know, decent will agree we need governments. You know, we do need a government of some kind. We need systems and order to basically make sure we have an orderly society that's fair to all. And so ultimately, that's what, that's the end result. You know, to get government back to what it should be, drive out this foreign force and get back um, not only what we had previously, but far better, which is actually a full working constitution, charter of rights that actually enables people to live in freedom um, and enjoy the fruits of their labor while following certain standards of conduct. So, but in getting to that place, there's a process and there's little battles that you've got to win on the way. So we're certainly threatened by now by a very great war. Um, hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Um, and look, ultimately it creates a lot of stress. So, well, Cody says, how's it? Hasn't it been like this for years? Yeah, look, no doubt it has. And that's why I'm saying you want to get a much better result. So first is just to gain back the lost ground. And then the next result is to not stop until we've actually built a government and a system, which is what it should be. So people, it's very, people are quite quick to give up their hard-earned rights. And, you know, I've seen many posts on Facebook and others about how our forefathers must turn in their graves. And I don't have any doubt about that. I mean, the guys like William Penn in 1665 um, and that, that brave jury who stood their ground when he was charged with um, some outrageous offence to do with his religious liberty, they were put in jail constantly because they refused to convict him. And that was the foundation of the Bill of Rights. I don't know if many of you know your history. And the, and the Magna Carta came about because a group of businessmen, barons, just basically got fed up with um, King John and his cronies just taxing the fuck out of them, stealing their money, passing whatever laws he felt like when he was having his gin and rummy, and went to him and forced him to actually sign a proper fair document with government. And that's what it's going to take again here again. It's going to actually take a rising up of business owners. And that's why I'm particularly excited about this group, because I've been arguing for ages, this, this, will, this city will not be won back in this whole situation if the business owners don't raise up because the business owners, by and large, are sovereign people by the fact you run a business. Anyone, most of you, I would imagine, are, and you know what it takes to run a business. It's hard work. It's, it's messy. It, you, it, it, when there's a problem, you've got to fix it. You know, you've got to sit there at night working your ass off to fix it. Um, no one's going to rescue you when something goes wrong in, in, in business. You've got to build systems. You've got to build marketing. 
you've got to keep the income coming in. You have periods of stress when the cash flow just dies out. Then you've got taxes to deal with. So you, you know, you learn. Um, someone's asking about what's our Facebook page. Our friends want you to watch. Could someone share my ID um, with everyone just to add me? Um, yeah, and I'll just check. I've got any friends requests. Um, oh, yeah, I'm getting some friend requests. Yep, here we are. Cool, another one. Yep, okay. Lol, never been this popular in my life. Classic. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so look, B's rights were fought by doing that. So business owners know what it takes. It's a, it's a lot of work to build a successful business. It's, it's, it's hard work. You know, if things go wrong, your employees walk away, but you don't. So, yeah, people are, I, I mean, many of us have done that. And I, I, I was walking around in the last lockdown and I actually had tears in my eyes at times. I was just, when I was, when last lockdown, just about everyone was wearing a mask and I thought, oh God, you know, what is going to happen to this godforsaken city? And at the time I actually said, fuck this, I'm just going to, get a camper trailer and just move up and live in the live in the bush in Exmouth. I said, I can't handle this. I really can't. And I meant it. And then, but I got this kind of sense that now nah, hang around. Um, there's a, you know, purpose. Katie, I've never worn a mask. Good on you, Katie. I, I have a couple of times. One time I, I dressed up as Ned Kelly and walked in the petrol station in the last lockdown. They pissed themselves laughing when they saw me. That was quite fun. So I've done that. Like I'll wear the most ridiculous mask I can just for a bit of a, and just dress as stupid. I did that a couple of times. Then I thought, nah, I won't keep doing this because this kind of lets people know it's okay to wear a mask and I'm complying, which, you know. Um, but there are legal ways to do that and things like that. So people with their hard earned rights um, are quite, um, you know, are quite quick to give up their rights. And, this is the reality of what we're dealing with. And it's going to take time and process and a bit more pain for a lot of people. And I, what I'm seeing is this lockdown has woken up a lot more people. That's my observation. No doubt it's woken up more people. It, I'm, I'm surprised I didn't expect it to. I just assumed. But I think at the end of the day, business owners are so fed up with being shut down and having their incomes at risk. That's the one thing that the Western world understands is money because that's the language we know. So... Unfortunately, for much of the West, we've become lazy from prosperity. It's not like we've lived in Uganda or communist where we've had to be strong to survive. Most people's ideas of suffering, as I said to someone, is that they can't go to Instagram and do the Hawaii bikini shoot. Um, they can't go and, you know, get drunk, visit their favourite stripper, you know, go down the brothel, um, whatever else they want to do in their meaningless lives. You know, and as you can see, I'm a straight shooter. I just like to say things as it is. Um, I naturally... I like to treat really well people that I love, people who are stupid, I like to insult them. I think they deserve it. And I think that it's the one language they understand is that when people are stupid, if you speak to them like they're stupid, they seem to understand it. So that's that's why some of you would notice I've got Bill Gates in my profile picture. And that's because I wrote deliberately write appalling posts. And um, ironically enough, it's actually been very successful in waking up a lot of people. Um, it's been quite funny. like. I found out it's gone viral in the US and a lot of spiritual teachers are sending it around because I'm writing like ridiculous posts just to actually teach people what's going on. Like today I wrote about, you know, Bill Gates recommendations for a quarantine facility for West Australia, which I went quite viral where I just suggested a deal with the Chinese Communist Party and um, to, you know, just sit and then just put some guys around the roof. And yeah, it was a lot of both. It's funny. It's one thing I've learned is a dark humour is the one thing that gets people going, shit, are they really doing that? I mean, today I had a talk with my mum. I couldn't believe it. I would have given my mum 0.01% chance of waking up. And she actually, from a lot of my dark humour and my post and my bluntness, she's actually waking up and questioning the whole gene therapy. And I'm not using the B word on, as you know, um, for the proof so I don't get censored. Um, but my mum is actually waking up. And I'm like, that's just impossible. But she actually is. She's questioning. Um, I'm having my Pilates instructor question as well. I'm like, shit, you know, I didn't think that would happen either. So just realise that people can wake up. You've just got to think creatively and think of ways to reach people on their values and, you know, be willing to kind of do whatever it takes 
um, Katie, you have to check your post now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just have fun. It's just fun. And Katie, it's just it's just um, like I said, my way. Um, I think my one the other day, Katie, you would have enjoyed. I basically said Dr. Bill's number one medical tip: um, don't you know, don't don't go into sunlight and don't eat natural foods, healthy foods, or or um, or vitamins. And I said, why? It's because it's a one size you know fit all, you know. Uh, and I said, whereas if you take synthetics, we can customize it to your body, we can inject it into you, and it will be far more effective. And I said, well, at least, uh, at least um, hopefully in theory that works anyway. Um, I said, hopefully in theory that works anyway. My computer reckons it will. And I said, um, if it doesn't work, tough luck. And I think my last post, I said, hi, all back from Africa. Just had a bit of fun experimenting with a few people. So, yeah, like I said, it's more fun being appalling. Um, and it is to be normal and it does wake people up and people kind of wake up quickly. It's also, I personally think that people who are attacking you and calling you anti-vaxxers, you can't just sit there and reason with them. They're here to attack you, giving you a reasonable argument. So I just attack back. And my attitude is that I learned this as a lawyer. If I can troll you back worse than you troll me, you'll probably back off me and they do. I mean, virtually no one now on these pro-vaxxer sites, you know, or pro-whatever sites dare to, you know, debate with me, you know, because as a rule, because I just go, I just hammer him, you know, so the V word or whatever else. The thing is, we just don't, on a serious note, we just haven't learned from history. And as Katie said, it's a spiritual warfare, you know, it really is. And um, it's, a, it's a financial warfare, it's a mental warfare, it's a spiritual warfare. Um, I remember reading the book of Revelation as a kid and studying it a lot and learning from my uncle and I'm seeing it live out in real life, what I learned, um, you know. So, yeah, so the mass exodus shows many to find. Look, I think many are up. I think this time around people are kind of snapping and they're over it, including, by the way, some of the government officials. So, but we just haven't learned from history. And socialism is just the biggest evil. That's why I appreciate business owners like all of you, because I know you guys all work your ass off. You probably spend late at night. You're the ones that are cleaning up your shops and doing all that. So when someone comes up and says, you've got to keep your shop shut because some dude may have happened to catch COVID in the kitchen somewhere in Cardinia, I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know. So it's crazy socialist distancing. The Art of War, I don't know if anyone here has read this book, but it's a great book of Chinese ancient wisdom by, um, by in the Tao. Um, there's a few, I use this book a lot in my, in my dealing with this whole situation with everything going on. Um, just a few quotes from it. Plan for what is difficult while it is easy. Do what is great while it is small. So this is, I have been working my ass off while these lockdowns have been going on and building business online. And the reason I've got a beautifully organized online business systems and I've got membership sites everywhere is I have worked my ass off. I've had my sons involved. It's been all hands on deck because I've just said, well, everyone else is panicking and running around doing their fighting. We're going to dominate in business and we're going to get this message out and no one's going to take us seriously because it's going to pick with silly little you know, people doing our webinars that, that do nothing. And one day they'll wake up and realize that our webinars are doing a difference. And I said this earlier this year, you know, so to get the word out and get the process happening. So you plan for what is difficult. And, and right now, surprisingly, but I might say, it's actually easy to stand up for your rights right now. It's not like you're living in the Roman Empire where you'll get crucified or where you'll get shot or where you'll get locked up in a remote camp on Christmas Island. None of that's happening yet. I mean, if it keeps going this way, I have no doubt that will happen. And they'll probably build all kinds of weird and wonderful facilities somewhere. But right now, it still hasn't happened yet. And that's the thing to remember. So this is the time right now to, to do whatever you take to get strong and get ready and prepare yourself and know the law and know how to deal with shit. So engage people with what they expect. It is what um, they are able to discern and confirms their projections it settles them into predictable patterns or response, occupying their minds while you wait for the extraordinary moment they can't anticipate. This is what governments are doing right now, psycho warfare. So the supreme art of war is subdue the enemy without fighting. That's my favourite because a lot of people are running around saying, I'm a freedom fighter. And I was asked this, so you freedom fighter? I said, no. They said, really? I said, no. So I don't need to fight for my freedom. I already am free. I said, God created me. I said, I understand that I coexist with governments and I've got to work with these guys. And if there's cartels running around, 
running the country I'm living in. Well, I've got to kind of find a way to coexist with them, but I am already am free. And I don't know if anyone's seen Beef for Vendetta, but if you haven't watched that movie, um, as well as I'm sure you've all watched The Matrix, in V for Vendetta, um, there's, a fa- there's a very important scene. I won't ruin it for you, but basically where Natalie Portman realises she's free. And the, the key is to subdue without fighting. And so far, I haven't really had any battles in the last 15 months and lived a very, very free life. So that's, that's the whole key here is always think how you can do this without getting yourself into, into a big argument with someone. So I remember being pulled over by a cop last year. And it was interesting because um, I was I was really relaxed to him. I said, hey, mate, what's happening? And he said, do you realise you were going like 22 k's over the limit? I said, what? And I actually was quite surprised because I was going on to the off the off ramp and I thought it was higher because they just changed the speed limit signs. I said, well, yeah, I didn't have any idea on that one. And um, he just goes, yeah, beat of vendetta, shall we? And then we end up talking and chatting away. And he said, oh, mate, he said, it's just crazy what's going on right now. I said, yeah, what's happening? And he said, yeah, he goes, I'm having to go to all these foreshores and all these freedom fighters and oh, all these conspiracy theorists. And I'm like going, oh, really? And I'm just listening and just chuckling along and not saying much. And he goes, yeah, look, he goes, I actually do believe you. He said, I think, he said, you strike me as a pretty honest guy. And he said, look, he said, um, how would you feel if I just gave you a small fine? Because I think you know you were going... You know, a few Ks over, I said, yeah, look, I said, doesn't, whatever. I said, let's let's just go ahead. And I just chose to go along that um, and moved on from that one. And in that time, did some other little tricks. So some fights I choose and fight hard, like the one when they start, we started trying to um, force me on some things. Yeah, there's a time you do have to speak out. But the key is right now is to pick your battles at this time, really pick your battles. And... I'll be teaching you stuff, and there's a lot of stuff you can do. And, look, I've won many speeding fine cases. I've won more than anyone I could just about ever know. I've got myself out of fines. But it's a lot of hard work to do it too. So the opportunity of defeating the enemy is usually provided by the enemy himself. It's more important to outfight your enemy than outfight them. So that's what I'm always doing. Most of my stuff is planning what's going to happen next, What, how long is this lockdown likely to go, what are they likely to do. And so far, I've been able to predict lockdowns almost to the minute, to the to the letter, and I've been able to work out when they when they're likely to come, when they've come, like how many days they'll go for. I I pretty much said with this one, I said that Mark McGowan, you know, it's he doesn't he, it, 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 we will will generally be the shortest lockdowns out of any of the premiers. He's just, you know, so and just understanding what they're doing and how they're doing it. The other thing too is even even understanding things like, for example, I remember saying working out where I where I was convinced that the cops would mainly be in West Australia, and where they were unlikely to be. And where I live, for example, I live more down in Coogee, Munster area, and by and large, I don't think I've seen a single cop in any of the lockdowns, even remotely up this way. So, yeah, it's really good to outthink your enemy, and this is why getting a good group together. The truth is there's some of you that I know are warriors and go hard. And the truth is you need all kinds of people in the battle. And my gift, which I bring as a strategist, like I said, I'm more see myself like a general who likes to stay there, strategize and plan and give whatever I can in terms of in terms of guidance. Um, Some of you I know will just go head to toe like Wayne Glue. I'm sure some of you heard of him. I mean, I think Wayne's an absolute legend. I mean, I couldn't do in any way do what that guy does, you know. so Wayne, Wayne is just brilliant. And these other guys like him who, and even friends of mine who've gone into court and, I, and they're just like my heroes. I go, gosh, you guys are amazing. And, um, you know, I know Wayne, we've talked and I think he's a terrific guy. And he's, you know, the kind of guy that, you know, hopefully in the future I'll team up with him more and combine what we both know. And... But, yeah, like sometimes we need to lose a small battles in order to win the war. That's another thing in the art of war, and I found to be very true in this. There's some fights that are more important. As an example, I think this therapy issue, this V word, is a far greater concern than any mask issue, um, even though I stand my ground on that one. That, is, that, to me, is a very genuine concern because I have friends in the UK and, um, and other places, and the side effects and shit that's going on is just like... Um, 
you know, absolutely phenomenal. Elsa, do you think we're having less lockdown not to serve the mining industry? I think that's in WA's favour. Mark McGowan's clearly very closely knit with the mining community. And right now, WA has on paper got the most prosperous economy in the whole world. And I think he wants to keep it that way. So that was another reason I was like, I could see, I thought I can, I was convinced that that he's doing everything he can to stop having to have minimal lockdowns. So appear weak when you're strong and strong when you're weak. And that's been one of my probably greatest secrets is just staying. Often when you, when you look like you're a great big freedom fighter, deep down you're scared shitless. Whereas I think a lot of people, why I, have under, I've kind of not taken me seriously because they think he seems to be a weakling. That's just because I've chosen to convey that image. Um, and I only, it's a bit like when, if you know black belt martial arts, you only pull it out when you need it. I only pull out my big swords when I really, really, really need them. So, um, yeah, apparently, Wendy, on, on the on the J, JP Global figures or whatever, WA has the most prosperous economy right now. Whether that's true or not, who knows? Before we go into some of the laws and the issues, like I said, we do. Um, if we don't get this sort, and like I said, the reason I spend a lot of time on that mindset, um, and I'm happy, like I said, was just because I can teach you all the best shit in the world. And if you don't have the right headspace for this, it's a waste of time. I think one thing I learned as a lawyer, and I was taught by the best lawyers, was it was all about headspace. And I remember one of the best lawyers I, who taught me how to deal with government investigations. And I said, teach me your best tricks. So this guy had phenomenal results. He said, well, he said 90% of it's strategy. He said 10% of it is actually knowing the law. He said it's actually knowing what to say. So the first rule I was taught, for example, is if I ever get um, the, the, the biggest way that they prosecute people is, what you, is how much you say. So the best thing you can do as you're arrested is shut up and just really deny and say very little. That's the first thing I learned. I was pulled in, I've been pulled into tax audits, government investigations. I was investigated by ASIC fraud squad, not for anything that I did in a fraud, but one of my clients I set up in a major offshore structure. He um he did some major fraud and swindle, and anyone involved with anything to do with him was called in and put over the coals. And people were going in there and six hours, five, six hours later were traumatized as ASIC tore them apart. I went in there an hour later, they apologized to me, and we talked about cryptocurrencies and I left. Why? I went in. I got. I got. I got the criminal lawyer. My sister said to her, "I just. I just turned up. I didn't virtually say anything. I didn't answer much questions. I just answered them. I didn't lie, but I only answered exactly what they asked. So if they said, "Did you receive money? No. Did you know what he sent his money to? No. I didn't elaborate. So I just kept things to the point. And that's very much how I've learned to deal with cops and deal with anyone and keep straight to the fact, keep to the law." And a prosecutor who I knew once told me that 99% of prosecutions are not based on what they know. It's what you give up in the first few meetings. And that's why the interrogation kind of asking you certain questions is to trap you up. The one time I got myself in the serious shit was when the legal practice board investigated me after I was winning all those speeding fine cases. No coincidence. Well, maybe it was, who knows. But exactly after I started winning those cases, I got investigated over a parking fine and that I was being a smart ass. And rather than do what I said, I actually decided to be nice and try and be helpful and gave a long response to them. My, I ended up having to get a lawyer to help me and the lawyer just kept saying to me, I wish to heck you hadn't written that stupid letter. He said, that's, that's gonna be hard to overturn. He said, you hadn't written that letter, he would have been over within three weeks. He said, they got nothing. And it took me three years to eventually get rid of the whole thing. But it was all because I wrote a stupid letter and elaborated and got into all these discussed with them. So in terms of what, so these are just some little tips I'm giving you right now. Um, strategy is so effing much. It really is. Um, I cannot, cannot overestimate it. And I find the problem with many people who are self-taught lawyers or common lawyers, it's a bit like people who are self-taught IT people end up being dangerous, you know, yeah, because they you get bits and pieces rather than learning the real art. And when I went to law school, for example, the, one of the first units I learned was about debating and arguing and, and reasoning and how you use reasoning to basically psychologically. When I, all the best lawyers who mentored me all taught me that strategy was absolutely everything. I had phenomenal results also in commercial law at one stage when I was involved with hostile people and having to negotiate 
stuff where like clients who had, you know, other parties who refused to pay over, you know, legitimate monies and that. And one of the best things I would I would do is just purely strategy and things like that. I can remember one particular case, and I didn't really know the law of this one, but I helped a client of mine who had, um, she was um, disabled and she would bought some gym equipment and then hadn't got around to picking it up for six months because she was so bad with her sickness. But then the company tried to deny she'd even bought it and were being hard with her and saying, in any event, it's too late for you because, you know, it's six months now. Now, I didn't write her a big, long legal notice or go through the law. I just rang the company and I, this is just an example of strategy. And all I said to them was, why? I, I just said, why are you um, not doing this? You know, I've got a copy of the receipt. No, oh, well, you know, we, our records don't go back that far anymore. We change our system. I'm like, well, I'll send you the receipt. And then they started trying to say, well, you know, it's been over six months in our contract. I, I just said, look, I said, no, I don't think you get the purpose of my call. And the guy said, what do you mean? I said, the question is not whether she's going to get her equipment because she will get it. I said, the only question is how much pain you're going to go through before she gets it. Because I said, she will get this, this equipment because we've got the receipt. I said, I don't care how ugly we've got to get and how dirty we've got to get in our legal fight. I said, we're ready for war, mate. So I said, I hope you better tell your boss to be ready for it because I said, I'm in the mood for it. I'm going to mood for it. He said, okay, can I call you straight back? I said, yeah, sure. And equipment came, came pretty much straight away. So a lot of it is just, like I said, it's strategy and being mentally tough. And one of the things I even do is I deliberately go swimming in, in, in freezing water every morning. And every day I always set myself one challenge, but something I don't want to do at all. Something uncomfortable, something that I just don't feel like doing. Like, oh, gosh, it's a terrible day. I'm out of sorts. The, the, it's a stormy day. The water looks awful. Great. I'm going in. And why do I do that is to remind me that life is uncomfortable to be successful and to win. So I find, therefore, when a cop, when I talk to cops or when I have situations like when I went into a grilled restaurant, for example, um, last lockdown, and the guy just wear a mask and I just said, look, I said, I understand you're doing your job, but I said, I do have a medical exemption. And he said, well, prove it. I said, well, I said, I'm happy to prove it for you, but I don't have any certificate because I haven't had a doctor to go see. And he goes to me, well, you know, um, can I need to see one. I said, well, I have another idea. Why don't you call the police right now and get them to come around? And then I'll talk to the police with you there. And um, we will then ring Princess Margaret Hospital and go through my asthmatic records as a kid. How about that? And, he, and, I, and I said, and then I showed him, my phone, I've got copies of all the mask mandates and exemptions. I've gone through them. I've read the directives in detail. And I started to coach him through the directives. And he said, look, mate, he goes, it's all good. Um, you can come in. So the case is unlawful for anyone to ask you to prove your exemption. Oh, look, I don't have much doubt about it. And that's, and um, Katie, I think they've got no right to. And it says that in some parts. I, I choose more for the fact that with most business owners, I kind of meet them halfway just because I've been a bit patient with them until now because I can see they're scared shitless and don't know what to do. As each lockdown has come about, I'm becoming less sympathetic. Like this one now, I haven't been asked for one, but I would be a lot less kinder. But the last one, I think a lot of them got hit and they didn't know what to do. So I was a little bit kinder to them. And especially I know that particular manager from Grilled. So what lies ahead? I mean, this is a whole other webinar that, in fact, the Awake Business have asked me to do. So on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, I'm going to be talking about the Great Reset that's coming. And I'm sure some of you have heard about this horrible World Economic Forum. And you're going to pretty much reset the financial system. And you're going to wake up one day and literally own nothing at all. So um, collapse, or at least economic systems and markets. Um, a breakdown of support chain. I don't know how many of you realise how much the supply chains are actually broken down. So we're heading for an almighty mother of a breakdown over the next little while, a meltdown. So the contact tracing, that's going to only increase and they're going to keep pushing this if people don't say no, no, or just at least. Um, and eventually they're even now inventing little things at the Pentagon that can monitor vital signs and cryptocurrencies they can inject into people. Um, I've been predicting from pretty much early on that they would not make the... the um, 
that basically the um, the V thing um, you know required, but they would pretty much make it difficult um, for and certain things like old age homes if you worked in them or. And I, I saw more the businesses as being the ones who will enforce it, the ones who are the bigger companies or the ones who are scared. Um, Sally says, how far off is this reset? Yeah, I'll be discussing that more on Thursday, Sally. So, um, yeah, so Sashi said they did today. So what do they do today, Sashi? So, yeah, so basically um, companies saying that you can only do um, certain things or whatever else if you get this. So that's... And I, I've been saying, I'm sure that like um, JobKeeper and then eventually they'll link to it and things like that. WA, as many of you know, I remember in 2005 when we were trying to put our, you know, kids in a little bit of daycare just for a little bit for one day a week. We couldn't get in anywhere because, you know, the V, the v list wasn't, wasn't complete. And so in the end, we just had to hire someone privately by finding a uni student to come to our house. So that's. You know, this has been going on a while. And the one positive of all of these situations I see it is at least a lot more people are aware about this now. So um, a lot, 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 lot more aware about it. So, yeah, and microchipping, I'm sure you've heard of Revelation and about this mark of the beast. Have everyone heard about this Revelation 13 um, and what that um, actually says? Just in case you haven't, I'm sure most of you have by now. Um, but yeah, so look, I'll just quickly show you this one here. Um, what it says, um, and this has been the big thing that many are realizing, it talks about the beast of taking over the earth and taking people's freedoms. And it says in verse 16, and he calls all small and great, rich and poor to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads, like a coding and by the way that's exactly what they're talking about in these new patents of chipping people in their right hand in their hands or their foreheads and they're doing it already in wisconsin in some in companies and in sweden in some places and that no one might buy or sell say they had the mark or the number name of the beast or the number of his name so this is all real stuff stuff i heard as a kid and i still can't believe i'm living it in real life but i actually am so that's the reality of what's going on so So the greatest ever threat to your health, and that's why I said this is this is something where right now you still can get educated and like you're doing and still take a stand and get used to taking a stand because I only think taking a stand is going to get stronger. Um, if you think that right now you're having to take the stand on a mask, well, wait till it goes to the next level and when they really start to put the pressure on with everything from the from the jobs, the businesses, the airline travel um everything making blatantly like you know unless you do this you can't get on this plane and things like that so it's going to require a lot of awareness a lot of education and a lot of standing your ground and enough food doing this so and of course your hard-earned wealth and money and businesses so let's have a bit of a look at the common law rights the order of creation and then look at some of the things so um this is stuff that you probably already know, but this is very important to understand. Why? Because this is going to help understand the state of emergency, and you've got to actually understand what it really means. And it's a bit of a mess. So if you're going to ask me to go through and give long provisional and, and break it down, I can only give it a little bit. I know a lot about this because when I was in the underground movement, I learned a lot about military law and admiralty law. And I always knew the day would come when they'd bring martial law across the planet and it would be done in a certain way. I just wasn't quite sure how they do it. And of course, now we know. And the reason is, is that the Constitution, and this was well known in England 200 years ago. If you were studying in England and knew the law with common law, it was well known that common law and, and martial law were two very different things. Because under common law, you've got constitutions, you've got bills of rights, you've got things like that, where you've got these basic laws to protect people's rights and freedoms. When you've got um, what's called martial law, Martial law, let's say that you join the army tomorrow and join the army reserve. One of the things that happens is you have to give up your freedoms. Um, that's part of the deal. So you've actually, if you go, you'll sign an agreement 
and the and the, and the general, the the comrade, the the commander in chief, they all take over your life. So you're under orders. You'll get locked in a brig if you're just a barrow. You get court-martialed. It's a whole different system, and it's the the rule of your superiors and the dictators. So that's how martial law works. Um, in the constitution, there are certain rights like the freedom of movement, the life, liberty, property, the rights to be able to, by and large, run a business, live as a capitalist, just do do what the hell you want to do. And the only way that true common law can be suspended or given up without you know someone coming and forcing you by taking you over is by mutual consent, by contract or by agreement. Like you join the military, you join the Navy, um, or like in a business, like you can actually enter into um, certain contracts where you might agree to waive certain rights. As an example, as a restraint of trade. If you, if I, if I decided to, um, let's just say that I was selling my business, and this is quite common, and the other person buying it said, "Look, I'm happy to pay you, you know, five million, Warren, but the last thing I want you doing is competing against me." So I might enter into an agreement with him for the next three years, I will not enter the same business. And then that way it gives him a chance to get a head start on me. So that's where I would, even though I've got the right to start any business I want, I may choose voluntarily to give it up because I'm getting paid something. That's why one of my little shit stirs is I say to people who are taking the gene therapy, I said, wow, I say, you guys are so brave. I actually admire you. And they're like, why? And I said, you're actually agreeing to be part of a medical trial experiment testing system with no compensation. I said, God, I'd be asking for a lot more than what you're asking for. And I'd, and then they kind of go, oh, you know, and they start going off at me. And I'd say, well, no, I, I admire you. You know, I really hope, um, you know, I'd be curious to how the experiment goes. Let me know if you get leprosy or if you, you know, get really sick or whatever else. And it's quite funny. They really don't know what to do. So being a shithead is a lot more fun than, you know, and it tends to stop other people doing it back. So life, liberty, property. Um, they're the three tenets of common law. Now, what does that mean in simple terms? I know, look, and sorry if some of you, this is very basic, because I know that um, we've got a mixture of people. And my guess is there's some people here who probably know a lot more than me and who are probably a lot smarter than me. And there's probably some here also who really are just starting from scratch. So, you know, please forgive me if it's, too simple or if it's overcomplicated, I'm just doing my best to get in the middle. And like I said, I'm happy to do other webinars to break things down a little bit more because this is just a very general webinar to get as much in as I can, to help you as much as I can and go from there. So life, liberty and property. Um, life means that, um, yeah, it means that basically if I choose to kill you, that's a, that's a problem. You know, I'm taking away your right to life. Or if I kidnap you, that's your liberty. And so they're obvious situations why you do need a government. And rest assured, if you're living in a tribe and everyone could do what they wanted and you had a stronger group coming in who felt they could take your daughters and, you know, force them into slavery, sex slavery, you'd be very quickly wishing for governments or protectors. So that's where governments pay a useful thing because life and liberty and property goes back to the Ten Commandments, which was the laws of society, the law of Moses that was designed to give a stable society. And property is the right for you to live freely in your property without freedom or fear of someone taking it. Like if I turned up at your house and said, hey, I don't, you know, I really like your um, your laptop. So I just walk off of your laptop. And then you say, well, give me back my laptop. I said, now nah, it's mine now. You know, I'm exercising my liberty to take your laptop. You can see there is a higher law being broken here. And this is where common law comes in. Sanctions that the law would bring in to say, no, 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 you can't do that. That, by the way, is one big problem with speeding fines because speeding fines, for common law, it always has to be a victim, okay? So there has, this is one of the first lessons I learned in the underground movement. It has to be a victim. The best way if you think, so how do I know the difference between common law and statute um, or common law and admiral and martial? The easy way is, is there a victim? Now, with tax, tax fraud, the, only, the victim is the state. That's an entity. That's not really a victim. It's just an artificial entity or corporation. Um, who's the victim with speeding fines? Again, the state. Um, who's the victim in terms of um, mask fines? Well, the state. I mean, governments would argue, you know, various kind of things, but basically the state. Um, so it's understanding that basic thing, life, liberty and property. And that's the whole hallmark of common law. 
that is why, for example, my kids always giggle when I'm driving because I just drive in bus lanes quite frequently. And they said to me, you're not supposed to be doing this. I'm like, well, can you see any buses? And they said, no. And I said, how many people have I got in my car? He said, yeah, you're a bus guy. I said, well, technically I'm a bus because I'm transporting you. I said, but in any event, what happens when a bus, when, when I see a bus in it? He goes, you don't go in or pull straight out. I said, of course I do. Because I said, I can see the purpose of a bus lane. I said, a bus lane um, uh, means that buses and public transport can move freely and move quickly to their destination without interference with their timetable. Now, so I have no interest in interfering because I can see for a good orderly society, it's important that trains and buses can run on time. So I said, I'll never interfere with a legitimate bus doing its job. But I'm saying, if there's no bus in the bus lane and everyone's jammed up in one lane, why would I not go in the bus lane? I said, just common sense. So common law is common sense. And that is why, for example, let's just say that I was walking into a highly contaminated COVID testing zone where everyone was sick and coughing and spluttering and sick as a dog. In all honesty, I probably would wear a mask and probably wear a whole lot more. I wouldn't want to go in there in the first place. That's one situation where I probably would go in there and I'd bloom and wear something. I mean, I would be like, shit, I don't want to be, you know, breathing in all this kind of crap. But when I'm walking on the beach, going for a walk around the local area, living my normal life, going into a normal shop, I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know. It's just, it just doesn't make any common sense. So that's what common law actually is. It's becoming a, a common law sovereign individual. And a true sovereign individual, by the way, is also a responsible individual. Like, that means they are aware of the rights of others. They're also aware not to violate the rights of others. But also can mean, like, I had a bit of an argument with someone who was, you know, trying to argue this business has got no right to make me wear a mask. I said, well, they actually do. I said, if we've got the right to, you know, stand up for what we believe, I said, well, if they don't want people in, that's their blooming right. I said, if enough people stand up for their freedom, I said, they'll soon have no customers and go broke as fuck. So that's why I said I personally don't have particular, I'm not particularly bothered in Australia with the gene therapy um, and oh, not being able to go to restaurants. Most restaurants would go broke if they lost like 40% of their clients or 50%. So I'm saying it doesn't bother me. The best way is to hurt the pockets and take action. So it's businesses have a right to do this. Um, businesses have a right like you all of our businesses have a right to say no like we don't want shedding from people walking in who've been jabbed you may decide that you may not want i know one of my friends runs a shop in frio she orders people to take off their masks when they walk in and i think that's wonderful um um Beth, it must be fun being in your brain yeah it is actually natalie that's exactly what i say let them go bust exactly but at the end of the day, part of being a sovereign individual means that you've also got to recognise that. And this is why becoming financially sovereign and independent and learning ways to get around stupid things. Because unfortunately, if I, if I woke up tomorrow and decided to be a dick and just decided like, nah, you know, I'm going to make anyone who comes into my store have to be jabbed. Well, really, why can't I do that? I mean, it's, it really is my right. And I would be an absolute idiot if I did that, but it is my right. So part of common law, and this is the part of common law people don't like to hear, is that this common law recognises that everyone has the right to do what they want to do, by and large. That also means if someone wants to be a complete and utter idiot, provided it doesn't hurt people, they can do that. And that's what else is saying. Yeah, governments have put that burden on businesses. Exactly. Governments are smart. They know they can't enforce it. They've got no intention. There's no way in the heck they'd be dumb enough to make it mandatory. So they will have a chat to their mate, you know, Mr. Al Joyce and a few others and, um, and their celebrity mates and get them to do their little promo commercials and get up and talk about it. You know, it's just things like that. And many businesses on, and some businesses will believe it. Now, in saying that, as I said the other day to someone, I said, if you haven't, after what's gone on the last year, at least been questioning what's going on, you're not going to awaken either that or you are a genuine, complete and utter idiot. And you're just not going to. So it's understanding that you've got to coexist in a world where you're going to have a mixture of very awakened people and a mixture of absolute idiots who are going to try and take freedoms from you, who are going to come out with absolutely absurd woke shit, say that you can't say mum and dad, you can't do gender. I mean, people who really should be in an asylum, but unfortunately are allowed to live and coexist. So it's actually learning to coexist with people. So that's a common law, basically. So that's the order of creation, as I've mentioned. 
This was a song I learned when I was in the common law movement and the underground movement from a really good teacher. And I'll actually sing it to you because it's a silly little tune, but I may as well sing it. It goes, a child who knows their common law rights will do well in life. A child who knows their common law rights will do well in life. A child who doesn't know their common law rights, they are vulnerable to addiction, coercion, divorce, suicide. It's pretty, pretty gum, pretty sobering song, isn't it? I was, I, I thought it was brilliant. Like, you don't know your common law rights. You're liable to addiction, to coercion, to being bullied. I mean, my kids did not get bullied in school at all for that reason. I taught them this. My, my first speech to them at school, when they went to school, I said to them, if anyone bullies you, hit them back. Um, if you see any other kids bully, getting bullied, go and beat up the bullies. And if you can't, come and tell me. We'll go into school and sort it out. And if I hear you bullying anyone, I'll beat you up. And that was my, my message to them. So none of them bullied any kids. And they... In fact, my oldest son stopped bullying on a few occasions by either getting involved or coming to see me and I would just go into school and I would remind the school of their duty of care to any future harm to any child from bullying was on their shoulders. They didn't address it. So I would actually let them know. I'd have a legal... My, the school I went to, fortunately, was a very good school. It was a church school in Wellard and I knew the pastor of the church. An excellent school. They moved quickly. They acted on things fast. But yeah, look... If um, I would always, but I would always walk in there with a legal notice ready to serve if they if, if they didn't listen, but they always did. That would have just let them know they were, um, that any future harm from bullying, they were now put on notice. It works very effectively. And by the way, um, if you ever say anything, legal notices and written notices on is, is really effective. And I've used it on all kinds of people with great success. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun dealing with a horrible person with legal notices. Um, you can use them in all situations. I can remember I had a really good friend um, who was pastoring a church years ago and um, I was going to help him out with some stuff. And he basically got all religious on me one day and he sent me this long email and was going on at me about, he was concerned about my moral failings because he heard certain things. I knew what had happened. My ex-girlfriend at the time had gone into the church and then spilled her beans out and, said all kinds of shit about things, which most of it I knew would be her, you know, exaggerated stuff at the time. And I just, I just said to him a legal notice and I just said to him, you are under strict orders to not repeat this, you and your elders of your church. If anyone gets leaked, I said, you will be held legally responsible for defamation and I'll fucking sue your asses off. And, oh, they rang me shitting themselves. And so I, I say to people, if in doubt, serve a legal notice. That's, that's my general rule. So if you're in doubt, just you know, just do it. If if you real if there's someone you care about, just do a nice one. You can just simply send them a written notice. But it's very important to do this. The law knows how to do this, and that's why bank serves you with credit cards. Um, this is why I practice myself regularly, even writing and reading very, very carefully um, mandates of masks and everything, which I'll, I'll look at shortly with you. We'll just go through that. So um, the common laws I'm mentioning here. Um, Life, liberty, property, law of Moses, this is admiralty law. The key to understand with admiralty law, it's only for um, times of extreme emergency or by voluntary agreement or civil conscription. You don't need a lawyer to do a legal notice. Um, you can learn to do it yourself. I'm happy to do a course and teach you all. I mean, you can bloom and do it yourself. It's not hard. Um, you know, don't empty your bank accounts paying a lawyer for that. Um, but the martial and admiralty law was only for... Um, you know, civil, um, you know, it was extreme emergency. So state of emergencies were meant for that purpose. It's because something really bad had happened, like a cyclone or an invasion from a foreign country, or there was like a serious threat to the liberty or like a major attack or an alien invasion or something. That was the purpose of it, like to really deal with an urgent, um, immediate threat. So these are some little phrases and... Um, you know, like public servant, not master, use of words and statutes, um, resident, things identified, person, um, a license being a permission to do something which otherwise isn't illegal anyway. This is one of my favourite one, by the way, the public servant. So I have, I've done that one for shits and giggles sometimes. I said to a, a government officer, 
you know, what's your title? You're public servant, right? And they go, yeah. I said, okay, so what does the word servant mean? And they look at me and I said, it means you're a servant. So who's your master? And they think about it and go, the public? I said, yeah. So I said, I'm your master. And it's quite interesting when you see their faces when you say that to them. So, um, yeah, the sergeant that ripped the hair out, yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, the thing is if something like that happens, if it's live stream ideally, but you've got to be very factual about it like about what happened, how it happened. I'd write the whole thing out. I would serve it on him, for example, and I would, um, yeah, if possible, you got to, ideally, if you get it in the media, it would be even more fun. And But to get it into the media, you've got to not come across as what's called a conspiracy theorist, angry nutter. You know, it's got to be really carefully crafted. But, yeah, I would definitely be serving a letter on that kind of stuff, um, on a lawful kind of common law one, um, absolutely. And I'm um, serving it personally and everything. Um, I've done it. We've done it on Coburn Council at one stage when they were spraying glyphosate. And um, yeah, it's kind of interesting when you do that. So yeah, look, basically, so public servant, um, a license, permission to do something. That's why if you want to get married, I mean, just get married by common law, just make your own agreement. That's been my approach now. Um, the Law cannot compel performance. These are some, there's a, there's a lot of them, but these are the ones. A big one, here's the two big ones to be very mindful of in dealing with these times with all what's going on. Um, it has to be consented to, number one. Now, in saying that, it doesn't mean that if it, they're going to kind of go, oh, sorry, but that is the first rule to understand. The second one is every law must have a remedy. That's why as soon as I hear of a new mandate, I look for the remedy, and it's always right. There's never not been one. So the mask rules is a remedy. The gene therapy, there'll be a remedy. I mean, it's always a remedy. This is one of the most standard maxims of commercial law. There has to be a way out for their cronies to get out of it. And silence by default constitutes consent. It's like how I did my own tax planning. I just studied what Google did, copy, taught myself it, and pretty much copied a similar system to them in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So there's always a way through any system. You've just got to be willing to put the work. There must always be a remedy. And But please listen to this one, everyone. Silence by default constitutes consent. So if you say nothing, it's assumed you've agreed to it. That's one of the rules of commercial law. Silence means you have consented it. So um, that's just very important. Let me just message this person back about it. I think someone else has dropped out. So... The Holy Bible is a good reason why courts, Freemasons and occult sorcerers use the Holy Bible. The law of Moses is the principles of our judiciary system, thanks to the Catholic Church. As examples, by two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. That's why banks always <coughs> serve three legal notices on mortgages. Take your house off you. Um, credit card companies do it. Ten Commandments is the foundation. What's interesting is it doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It says, thou shalt not kill unlawfully, if you read it carefully. <clears throat> so self-defense is perfectly fine, even though in the Australian culture now, self-defense is not fine. Um, the Bible clearly talks about tax uh, minimization as well. <clears throat> I got to learn, learn a lot of my tax minimization training from the Bible. Jesus gave a long speech when he's asked if um, his disciples had to pay tax. It's an amazing reading. And like I said, all of this stuff I can teach separately sometime. Um, Jesus gave a clear um, methodology for handling a legal dispute in the underground and common law. And most of his people, by the way, weren't very religious. Um, and they were specifically teaching what Jesus did on handling legal disputes. You go one-on-one, -on -one, you talk to them first, then you bring two or three witnesses, then you go to the court. That's the system that he gave. So one-on-one, -on -one, and then if they don't listen, then you send more notices. That's why the legal notice is having two or three. And the other one is a balanced and just money supply, gold and silver. Um, something that's backed by legitimate rather than a fiat currency. Um, Bianca, hang on. Isn't there case law where states of silence and loan is not consent? It depends in what context. Um, this is what's talking about the maxims of commercial law and understanding how it actually works. So have it type in maxims of commercial law. By default, if you leave the field of battle by silence, you will lose. That's the basic maximum of commercial law. 
So as anyone here, very few people will me have, but I learned about this group in the underground movement. They were removed from the history books. Anyone here heard about this group? I'm curious if anyone's heard about them. If you are, you're one of the rare people. Okay, there's a few people. Yeah, I thought there might be. But um, yeah, they were removed from the history books. But these are the dudes who are behind everything that's going on. Um, they've done everything to keep themselves hidden. Um, they are behind their diabolical um, group of people. Um, they are highly religious. That's why if you're wondering why all these weird restrictions are coming in, they are a highly religious group. You know, that's why I have no doubt they want to try and bring the world vegan or some shit like that. They are very, very highly religious. Um, they use what's called the, the Bible, the Talmud, the, which was they use the Bible for legal, but the Talmud was a book they made up themselves. This is the book where if you read it, it includes pedophilia. You are called what's called Gentiles because you're not one of their class. You are cattle and of a lower consciousness and you have no rights whatsoever. And it's good to swindle you in business. And it actually says it's in the Torma. There's a sanitized version and then there's a truthful one. But the truthful version says the highest form of sexual um, intimacy is between ages three and nine. It's a horrific book and you better make sure you've got a bucket if you read any of it. But um, So they don't regard your rights in any way, shape or form. You know, this is why you got to know what you're up against. This is why I personally believe Trump eventually lost because the one thing he didn't estimate was just how bad these people were. I think he knew better than anyone else has been in, but he didn't realise even think even they would blatantly defraud an election in public view and censor everyone like brazenly without any shame. And you could just see, I mean, I've actually got a client who is close, who's his, whose roommate actually has a, has a phone direct to Trump and knows him pretty well. And, yeah, he basically... I got completely caught up by this whole thing. So um, the Kazarians, they're in the slide. So the, if you want to know more about the Kazarians, buy this book or just find it online, The 13th Tribe by Arthur Kohler. They were a barbarian group that were known for their brutality and conquest. They would spear, you know, they would get women with kids and they would, like, throw them up in the air and spear the baby and they would um, bayonet them and... They do bane at the board. They were horrific. You know, when they, they burn the country to the ground and force people to come out and live as slaves. They were known for their particularly barbaric way. They got sanitized and joined Judaism religion in the seventh century, um, King Bulan, in a deal that was made when the, when the Pope wanted them out of the scene because of their problems they were causing. And they, and guess where they ended up? They moved into the financial system. <laughs> so there you go. And, that's, and they end up in Venice and Every country that these dudes got themselves into, they were kicked out of um, eventually because they ruined the financial system with their mortgage systems and their um, stuff like that. And they were known for the horrific stuff like that. So that's a whole nother webinar, which I just don't have time to do. But yeah, then you got Mr. Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum guy, going on about the food shortages. And here you go here. Um, so pretty much. Um, the time for safety with your dollars, with your freedoms, with everything. Now let's have a look at lawful rights and mask stuff. So what's the deal with masks? Okay, let's have some fun. And let's go and have a look at some of these um, pages. I've especially got these up. So, okay, here we are. Yeah, so I always just go straight to the sites and have a read of the directions because that just, you generally find pretty clear stuff. So the coronavirus directions, you go in here, and it's always, the problem is it's very hard to, to work this out. And I'm sure you all know that. You've got to kind of go all over the place. So you go, so I go into there, um, still going about the lockdown. So it's, okay, so I found something else. Latest updates. Um, end of lockdown. So you can see the post transition here. So um, you go through here, continue wearing a mask unless exemptions apply. Now, when you keep going through here, I go, okay, is there any more exemptions in here? Um, no. So for example, I just read what they say. I was very good at being a smart ass with the law. So I just read what they say. So notice they keep it very vague deliberately. 
but exemptions apply. So where are the exemptions? Um, we'll come back to this in a minute, but these are just some examples. Um, so this is the um, Queensland one. Um, let me find it here. Um, where's the Healthy WA? Oh, here we are, Healthy WA. So the Healthy WA site, um, face masks are required, it's mandatory. Um, when should I use a face mask? So um, let me go through this. People who have a physical or mental illness, condition or disability while wearing are exempt from the requirement. You may wish to ask. So again, you may wish. In other words, it's not a requirement. You may wish to, and you're perfectly welcome to do that. Um, and this is the problem. I would just be showing them that very calmly, very respectfully and saying, it just you may wish for, I don't see any evidence of this being compulsory um, that this can be done. Um, I've already decided that if the cops pull me over um, and talk to me about it, for example, um, hang on, I, I, would, I wouldn't be saying I'm not telling you what it is. I don't have any problem telling the cops what my basis is for medical exemption whatsoever. Um, I'm just accepting friends. I think they're trying to join. Um, I would, yep, yeah, I would absolutely in no way, you know, um, I, I don't have a problem with it myself. I mean, I understand some people like their privacy. It doesn't particularly bother me. It's all over Princess Margaret Hospital and other backgrounds. I just say to them, um, as your law enforcement officer, I've got no problem telling you. Um, and that's just my own voice and everyone has their own thing. But as you can see, that's written there. So it's pretty clear that a physical or mental illness, um, condition or disability, and what I do is I take screenshots of these and keep them on my phone. Now, in terms of what constitutes this further, the difficulty is trying to find more information on this. Um, so I went further. And what I did was I went into the Queensland one, which I found very helpful. The Queensland one has pretty much the same requirement, except they go a little bit more. Um, so, so as you can see here, it's virtually the same. Examples, a person who has obstructed breathing. Um, I had asthma as a kid. That's a home run, you know, clear as fuck. Um, a serious skin condition. I've got a copy of that Queensland one as well. An intellectual disability, a mental health illness, or have experienced trauma. Yeah, so pretty damn broad. So um, the main thing is that they only understand law. I show that. And, you know, it's just because it's pretty much the same provision. So it's giving you a bit of an idea. The main thing is at that point, you're giving a dispute. So this is the Queensland site I'm using because I find their ones a little bit better, but they're using the same requirement. So you can see it again here on the Queensland one. So that's just an example of how you would do it. Now, if you go back to these WA directions, let's have another look at some of these other things, for example. And just to actually read what they say. Because there's always two choices. You can take them head on or you can just look and go, well, there's always a remedy, like always a remedy. There has to be. So, well, it's not a provision. This is the thing with law. Um, someone said, with provision for another state. The, it's not a provision. It's an example or explanatory text. If you actually read what's here, um, there's a directive, which you've got to read. So the, the West Australian directive, let me find this here. Um, is here. Now, if you actually read the Queensland one, and there's a, an assumption in law, um, but if the same government with the same requirement, clearly they've spoken to the same legal advisors, and so you can pretty much safely say to them, would you agree that it's the same one here? This one just gives a bit more clarification, WA1 doesn't, so this is giving you an example. So I think it's fair to say that, um, that one. Um, in terms of a doctor refusing to give a written exemption, um, yeah, look, the reason why is I think most people go in to see the doctor and they don't think about what they're doing. If you suddenly turn up to a doctor's clinic saying, hey, I want an exemption, dude, many of them are going, well, 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 because they're nervous to be licensed. So I'll do another webinar sometime if you want and share more about that. But there's a way you can get that exemption pretty easy. Um, or well, not easy, but I've had clients get it. You just, it's going in there and really just walking in patiently through the situation. Um, and you know, why you actually, you know, need that. So, and my experience, like I'm saying, is that it's just, so you just got to 
go very slowly and break this down, even though it's annoying. So um, you can actually see here that this Queensland one gives a lot more detail. And but I, I remember when Melbourne's mask mandate came out, I pissed myself laughing when everyone was running around wearing it because their exemptions were 10 times broader than ours. I mean, you know, you could have, anyone could have got out of the Melbourne one. And I was trying to convince my friends over there, not one of them would exercise it. I just said, read the Bloomin' Health Department, um, you know, mandate. It's really simple. So if you go here, for example, let's have a look at something else just to help you all out. Um, now, the most silly one is that pretty much anything can reopen as of tonight, except for fitness clubs, gyms, casinos, and nightclubs. Now, <laughs> Yeah, nightclubs are probably, if COVID, would, you know, if it's really that dangerous, it's probably the one thing I can half understand, not that I'm into all this shit. Um, but fitness clubs compared to, say, other clubs and we're outdoor. So notice, for example, that fitness club, like what is a definition of a fitness club or fitness centre? So I would go into the definition. This is just giving you insight how you can do this yourself and just use your brain a little bit. So let's see. Definition, not getting much help here, so let's try something else. Dictionary definition fitness. The condition of being physically fit and healthy, the quality of being suitable or whatever else. Now, a fitness centre generally has a certain meaning. So a yoga centre, for example, or a re relaxing meditation centre, I would, for example, argue doesn't mean they agree. Well, no, that's not basically it's not a fitness center um it's something completely different and um what i would be doing for example is if i ran a center like that which i don't i would be writing up an, an, a note and a letter with all of my argument and my reasoning i would um and basically keep that on hand and say and i would email it even to someone like um i knew like a friend or whatever and then i would show it to the police and say yeah look as far as i'm concerned um we're not that. So there's generally always a way around this thing um, and to not actually do it in most situations. And then if it is, like this one clearly, then the next question is, well, I just completely ignore it. And, if, and what's interesting is in Italy, a lot of businesses just chose to ignore it. What is inspiring about the Awake Business Group is that if you've got like literally 5,000 businesses just all decide no, you know, um, we are not going to actually do this, um, then they've got a bit of a problem, haven't they? If 5,000 businesses, but they get fearful of the fines and they get fearful of this. But if 5,000 businesses just said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, if it's a fair, reasonable restriction, it's like if I was running a quarantine centre and I had sick people jammed up in my home, I probably would say, yeah, well, let's just, I think some kind of protective gear would make some sense. But... You know, it's really, so it's just doing all that stuff. And again, un also understanding the responsibility at the time as well, because the reality is um, it's whether you like it or not, most of the world is freaked out over this silly virus. And if, um, you know, you were just completely reckless with your center and it broke out there, you're probably going to have a community outrage and that would just be annoying. So it's just being smart to actually do it and how to deal with these situations. But so as you see, if I'm running a business, I just go through this whole thing. It's why I also chose to build a strong online thing to basically say, I am not going to let myself be in a position where I'm vulnerable to government. So one thing I would strongly encourage anyone on here as well is to start to, uh, while, while standing up for your rights, it's very difficult and challenging and frightening to stand up for your rights if you don't have a lot of money or if your whole income source is vulnerable and dependent upon, you know, a government not locking you down. That's not a good position to be in. And I would be, you know, as this lockdown ends, which is ending and life gets back to, you know, semi-normal for a time, be really thinking, how can I start to build myself an income and start to actually get myself financially into a position where I can still run these businesses and stand my ground. But if I stand my ground and have to go through a fight for a while on this, I'm not going to be caught out, you know, in a vulnerable position. Hope that makes sense. So that's just an example on the masks. Um, the other ones, which I'll quickly cover here before I take questions. So these lockdowns, now what is a state of emergency? Now, 
as I mentioned, it's only meant to be for temporary extreme situations. Now, I've had a bugger of a time working this whole thing out, but and I still haven't really, but I've got a, I've got enough idea I could at least give some idea. Um, WA Section 58 of the Emergency Management Act um, is what's actually used over here. The Act under Section 10 appoints the Commissioner of Police as the Emergency Management, so basically it means that Chris Dawson, the Police Commissioner, and the World Health um, Organization representatives, who's the Chief Health Officer, who's actually in charge under that one. So basically, um, what's his name? Andrew Robertson, I think is the Chief Health Officer. So basically, Mark McGowan is not running the state. Um, and so the state is being run right now by basically Chris Dawson and Andrew Robertson and whoever's behind them. So that's the first thing to realize is how the law works. This is why Lord Blackstone, who's probably one of the most famous legal commentators, said, woe to the people whose governments declares martial law in times of peace to remove their common law liberties. It's quite a sobering reading by Blackstone written in 1850s. You know, woe to the people whose governments declare martial law in times of peace to remove their liberties. It's really shitty when that happened. So let's have a look at the um, declaration. So when you even look at it, Minister for Emergency Services, who was appointed um, to work basically with the Commissioner of Emergency Services, which was, of course, Chris Dawson, um, Francis Logan, who's no longer there anymore, and um, he issued the State of Emergency last year. And it applies to the State of Western Australia, 1245 last year, and remained in force, as many of you have rightfully pointed out. They, it continues to go on. Keep in mind that when you read about a State of Emergency, um, what is the point of it? It says they, they have a responsibility to prepare and plan for disasters and emergencies. So it's to facilitate the high level. So it's basically, when you read it carefully, it's meant to cover cyclones, um, severe bushfire breakouts, like what we happened, um, what happened like a, a couple of months ago in WA. It's meant to handle um, basically you know, suspending civil liberties temporarily if there's complete anarchy or rights or civil disorders or something like that, or like the country's under invasion and you really can't afford to have people running around asserting rights when Japan is walking in with guns ready to shoot everyone. So that's that was the purpose of it being done. It's only for extreme situations. And the, the, this is why they've been so keen to keep the state of emergency going or why whoever's driving this agenda you can see it just keeps it going, keeps rolling in the lockdowns. Because while it's a state of emergency, all rights are suspended. So when you claim I have rights, no, you do not have rights. And that's the thing to realise. And that's why it's got to be like, no, no, it has to get back to common law. And you first got to realise that your rights are the fact that you're a child of God, first and foremost, and that the government is under you. And that's a mindset thing. But understand legally, West Australia has a real problem right now. OK, and a lot of people in various seminars will get you inspired and say, this is all unlawful. They can't do this. You've got to realize this is a real effing problem. It's a serious problem. They have they've invoked ancient laws, which goes back to common laws and everything else. And they've invoked a state of emergency. It's a blatant abuse of process like it's a blatant abuse of process, because when you read the state of emergency legislation, it's meant for things like bushfires or cyclones or temporary invasions or things like that, or for a pandemic that's really serious, like a virus racing through the community for temporary. But it's a, it's, so it's a blatant abuse, like it's horrific abuse what's going on. But um, yeah, so people can say that, you know, it can only be suspended with human rights. No, Australia doesn't really, if you read, if you read the laws carefully, what they're doing right now, it's a blatant abuse of process. It's like twisting like you wouldn't believe. But right now they've implemented a state of emergency and it's, yeah, it's got to be stopped. Like we, it's got to get the parliamentarians to stand up and say we're not going to pass the state of emergency because this is, this is abu an abuse of process. It really is. And that literally, on um, that one thing alone, can cut out a lot of what's going on. So it's really, but it's really important to get that if um, it's, it's going going around asserting that you know I'm, 
you know, this is all unlawful what you're doing. It's it is, but it's it's more a, a severe abuse of process and human rights is more accurate. Technically, unfortunately, what's been done is lawful, although in saying that, it's like I said, it's a very blatant abuse of process. And certainly if it ever got before your court and, and, and it was something like that, an international court, um, there would be serious questions actually raised. So the Emergency Management Act, if you just go into it and you can search online and you find it um, and you read this legislation, like emergency, it really has got nothing to do with the shit that's going on. So I found the State of Emergency Management has a plan and you can see what it says here. It's for air crashes, animals or plants, pestle disease, a spilling of a chemical, cyclone, earthquake, um, loss of electricity, fire, flood, um, heat wave, an academic, hostile act, land search, um, but yeah, it's coming for what's meant to be a temporary thing, not for the kind of stuff that's going on. So how do you deal with that practically? That is the really big question. Um, some of you are going to be, if some of you are inspired to mount a case against them and can find lawyers who really are very good at understanding that kind of stuff, you look absolutely it would be brilliant um, if, that would, if that would be addressed um, to do that. For others, while that's still going on, the reality is while they're passing this state of emergency and abusive process, they pretty much can give these directives. And, um, and but in saying all that, that's why there's remedies everywhere. <clears throat> like you see the mass legislation, there's, there's, there's remedies everywhere when you read it. If you actually read between the lines, there's, there's, there's plenty of remedies. And... It's just a case of knowing how to deal with these, with these people. So all I can say to you is that, um, and yeah, that the courts are rigged. Well, unfortunately, Natalie, yes, they are. I mean, this was a problem I found. I mean, I went, I went when I was a lawyer, and I actually proved with a long legal argument, and I have no doubt to say I was right, but the speeding laws are, are what's called ultra virus. In other words, they don't actually work. They're not allowed. They actually go outside the powers of the government. And I mean, I researched this for days and I was convinced I was right and I still am. And I've shown this to people who are the lawyers and they've said, you're a clever bugger, you know. They said, we don't think you'll win though. And they pretty much just dismissed the case without even giving it a proper hearing. But yeah, I tried to get the whole speeding laws knocked out in WA in 2013, but without success. So yes, that is the challenge that you face. So that's why I said you've got to be really called cool to do that with the courts. And the main thing to understand is to read things carefully. And especially when you're dealing with government people, number one, realize with cops, they're just doing their jobs. They're just normal people. That's how I see them. They're guys with, you know, it doesn't make what they're doing is right, but they're normal people doing a job and probably thinking they're doing the right thing. So that's why if I, if, when I get pulled over, I always just talk to them very normally and I calmly would just go through and I would just be showing them my stuff and saying, I've got no problem with you speaking to say this, giving my basis for the exemption um, and saying, because, yeah, look. And the other thing you can do too, this is my other thing I do as well. There's an old saying that says, um, any of you have got children, let's say that you've got three children, two of them are sitting there quietly and one screaming his little lungs out going psycho, who's going to get the attention? The one who's kind of screaming and going psycho, or in other words, the one who's making all the noise. So... One of the things that I would that I would I would do, for example, and I have no problem doing it, and especially if your medical exemption is legitimate, um, is you say, well, this is actually a serious risk to my health, you know, and I'm very scared and I'm very concerned about this. And you just, yeah, that's one of the things you can do as well. Just be very clear and say, this is a serious risk for me. And um, what do you want me to do? I can't wear this mask right now. Um, and that's why the medical exemption exists. And yeah, look, basically the main thing though I, 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 is to show them what's actually written there. And I do know people who this has happened to. And when they show them that and actually go through it with them and don't just say, I've got a medical exemption because everyone's done it, understand that probably cops hear that from everyone not wearing a mask. So it's, it's important to go there, really having thought out your argument. And this is why I said, it's not my job to give you advice but I can guide you and kind of say to you, just really think through what you're going to say. 
the smart individual is well planned long before they, they meet a crisis. I mean, I always assume that the worst is coming and I plan my life accordingly on that basis. So that's how you handle something like this. Um, coerced vaccines, things like that. Again, the same thing is to realise that with, with, with employers as well. Um, if you've got any whiff that you've got an employer um, that's willing to do that, I would be doing two things. Number one, I would be asking, will losing this job severely make me vulnerable financially? And if the answer is yes, you're going to have to move fast. You're going to have to start thinking how's there a way you can get other income, have a backup plan. Um, make sure you've got a backup plan in the event that you're standing up for yourself doesn't actually work. Um, because unfortunately, the employer equally has a right um, to stand near ground with you too. But then the other one I would do is, yeah, notice of liability. The way I would be handling it is a legal notice. And I'd be saying to them, um, basically, a bit of something along the lines of being discriminated against, but also saying to them, um, you actually, uh, you know, I, it's my body, my choice. You know, you're basically telling me, um, I'm not saying use his words, but the idea that would be coming through is that you, you know, by, 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 by commanding that someone is forced to take something into their body against their consent is a violation of their body and a violation of their rights. And say, I've got, you know, medical reasons and grave concerns. Um, and, you know, you do this and basically you have a duty of care basically not to do this. And if you're kind of indirectly coercing me to do this, I regard this as coercion. Now, some employees are strong enough legal notice for some bosses, it would probably work. Some bigger corporations, it's less likely to work. So you've just got to also read your employer's policies very carefully. So I would be asking to read their policies carefully, read what they're putting and find out their basis for it. So half the time when you actually read this stuff, you, um, you, know, you find this kind of stuff out um, very quickly. So um, yeah, so look, your job or business as well. So any kind of fines, um, the number one thing I would say to you, because like, I'm happy to do more webinars is because I clearly understand that I've had to do things differently today, but I'm just going through generally and I'm almost finished for questions. Connor, would you consider challenging on religious grounds? Well, I've done that on a lot of things, Connor. I, I got out of voting by doing that. Um, the church is still to this day, um, like I said, the best um, structure to set up, you know, they, they've been legally you know, free of tax for, for centuries. Um, so yeah, religious, religious ones is very strong in the constitution. The high courts have always protected religious rights very, very strongly. So that is, um, that is definitely an argument at saying I've got that. I've also got religious reasons, but again, you've just got to make sure that if you say that you've got it and you've got to be able to argue your point and explain why that is the case and why your system doesn't let you do that. So that's a good example. So anyway, um, that's pretty much covered some of these points. What I'm going to do now is take questions. I know someone asked me, is there other stuff you do? Look, I'm happy to be doing more webinars. And like I said, um, I'm going to be actually running a um, webinar um, on the Great Reset coming up. Um, when is it? Um, yeah, I'm going to be running that on Thursday night. So Chris. And, you know, for the group has asked me if I can do that. So Thursday night at seven o'clock, I'll be doing that. So, um, yeah, what I'll quickly show you, I'll, please send your questions through and I'll start going through your question while I'm doing that just before this ends. These are my websites, just so you know, this is our, I do have an awakening one, but just for now, so I don't overwhelm you. That's our, that's our financial one with tax planning and all that, and that's protection. Um, our other, that's wealthsafe.com and this one here is our Global Wealth Club. Um, that's the one where we're teaching about the Great Reset. So that's this one here. So yeah, so we got various stuff on there. But we'll be speaking about all this on Wednesday. So any questions? And like I said, I'll go through all this. Let me have a look. Are the fines for not wearing masks lawful? Ah. Uh, Look, I've heard arguments about that kind of stuff. Um, Mike, I've heard that there are lawyers who found ways around it, but they're not lawful in Melbourne and things like that. I'm curious to know more about that myself. Um, 
technically, as I understand martial law, if the directive is coming from the chief health officer and you're in a state of emergency and he's been given the power on the State of Emergency Act to make directions like they've done, um, it's certainly legal under martial law. The main argument would be that you do not consent to that law. So, but yeah, I like I said, I'm sure there's lawyers. Um, I'm not a lawyer anymore myself, as I know. I'm sure there's some very smart people who've found ways around that. Um, but yeah, if that all makes sense. So, not only am I obliged to use the Tracing Act. Look, my I don't know if you'd notice, but most shops don't even enforce it. You know, um, they. You got the sign in register, which you can just write it down. I don't use the app myself. I've never used the app. And I just never get asked. I think once or twice I've been asked. Uh, if I got asked, I put it down uh, myself, but I've only been asked in, but I noted that for future and I just avoided that place. But I think I've been asked twice. Um, no, I'm not reading questions on Facebook. They're coming in the chat. But yeah, so um, now, Sally, what about state and federal law being inconsistent? The, the, the problem is with, um, with the state and federal law is that the way the Commonwealth Constitution works compared to that is there's certain areas of responsibility that the Commonwealth are allowed to do and there's certain ones that the state are allowed to do. So, for example, the Section 51 of the Constitution gives certain rights and things like that for what they can do. So I've heard many weird and, um, you know, wonderful things about, you know, that kind of stuff. But the states have a lot more power than people actually realise. The whole idea of the federation that was set up was that the states did not want to, you know, give up a lot of their powers. They just more agreed to set up a commonwealth to cover certain functions. So if you go through and you read Section 51, so, for example, they couldn't do civil conscription. Um, so when you say if you don't agree with state law, can you default to federal law? It just depends. There's some laws that federal can do, some that state can do. And um, if they contradict, um, well, my understanding of it is, again, it depends on the particular, it depends on the particular law. I know states have certainly got the power to manage their own health and the Commonwealth can't take that away from them. And in fact, there's, this particular, there's an actual prohibition against civil conscription. Um, I know that much. So, which basically means forcing some kind of medical system on people with the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth can't do it, but the states can. So that one I know, the Commonwealth couldn't force a big COVID kind of, you know, emergency, but the states can. That's why the states had to do it. Do you have to consent by, um, can you get out of the PCR COVID test? Um, the PCR COVID test, there's a guy called Nigel March, Kim and Nigel March. I don't know if any of you know, but they're in some of the weight groups. I know that they've managed to, you know, avoid it when they've come back. So, um, yeah, I haven't even tried to take that one on myself. I've just, um, I would just straight out be saying how I'd handle something like that myself. I'd be saying to them, um, what is your wealth safe website again? Um, Oh, yeah, I'll just type it in the chat. Um, w, w. But yeah, so how would I handle that one? Here we are, that one there. And I'm just typing it in the chat, chat another one. So um, how would I handle that? Yeah, look, I would. I know that I would do. I'd first read the mandate thoroughly, exactly on the test. I haven't had encountered that. Hasn't, I haven't bothered with it. But I would just read the mandate very, very carefully and find out the things. There's going to certainly be a remedy in there somewhere. Um, then anyway, what I would do is I can remember when they tried to put pressure on me to have a certain medical treatment years ago, I just said, are you happy to sign a full um, liability um, form? I said, what do you mean? That you will agree to take 100% liability personally, as well as the hospital for any medical expenses if this goes wrong. They said, well, of course not. So I'm saying, so why would I do it? And then they back off really quickly. I'd be saying about, I'd say, well, my understanding is this thing, I have a very sensitive nose. I'd say, I don't particularly relish having that thing go up my nose. So I'd say, um, if I have any pain or anything like that, are you happy to sign a full, you know, statement where you will agree to pay me trauma compensation money? So if you're happy to do that, I'm happy to take the test. 
That's what I'd probably be saying. And I've learned if you make it too hard and you're pain in the ass, they just get rid of you. So that's how I'd be handling that myself. Um, and I'm certain it would probably work. So um, what else? Yeah, I, I think that PCR test is just some big vaccine um, or not vaccine, um, what's it? DNA, DNA collection agency, that's my opinion. Um, might be wrong. Do you think Section 58 will be enforced? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant to top mention that one. That's good you raised that one. Um, yeah. Okay. You've got to remember who passed this, this law. This was not passed by um, Mark McGowan, okay, or Roger Cork. This was passed by that horrendous premier that was before either of them, the guy who decided to use our beautiful Belia wetlands as a Chinese commercial road building ground. And even my sister, who's a lawyer very much in the system, was chained to a tree to try and stop him doing it. You know, it was just, I don't know if anyone remembers that period. And um, so one thing I was very grateful to Mark McGowan for, and that he kept his promise. And when he got in, he stopped that bloom and destruction of our wetlands. So Colin Barnett, by the way, many of the awful provisions that you actually will find weren't actually passed by Mark McGowan or Roger Cook or any of his current government. They actually weren't passed. And I checked into this carefully. It was the Barnett government that were passing atrocities. For example, Jeff Gallup in 2004 um, legalised um, cannabis. He decriminalised it and let people be able to take recreational. The first thing that Barnett did was he got in, he said, hey, I'm going to have a war on drugs. And he and Rob Johnson went after anyone who even had a plant in their backyard. I mean, they were disgraceful individuals. And um, I personally think, you know, and don't shoot me, I think Mark McGowan is a significant improvement on him. I mean, I'm certainly not agreeing with a lot of what's going on of in any way, shape and form now, but I certainly think I could only shudder what would have happened in our state if Colin Barnett had been in charge. That's all I will say. I would shudder. I could not imagine what would have happened, you know. Um, it would have been, I think, beyond awful because um, he was the one who passed this law. So I read this law and shake my head. I'm like, how anyone in their right mind could have passed this law? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's just basically a virtually, to me, this law goes back to the Prima Noctony. Have anyone heard of the Prima Nocta? That was the law that in, they passed in England that said that any virgins on their wedding night, the king's soldiers got first crack at them. And that's virtually the same as that, as far as I'm concerned. And that's what I would, if anyone ever tries to do that, I would be like, oh, God, I think I don't know what I would do. Ah, uh, yeah, the Braveheart movie. So Prima Nocta, there actually was a law in England that the king's soldiers got first crack of the, the women on their wedding night. Um, I mean, I personally don't think that, that Mark McGowan or any of their team would do this stuff myself, but the fact that it's written down means he could leave any day. He could quit and someone else could come in and that would and then lo and behold, they'll be doing that shit. So, yeah, this definitely needs to be addressed um, in some way. I think that the problem is right now, there's so many things that need to get addressed in the state right now, and that's half the problem. You know, there's so many things needing addressing. So, um, but yeah, include, remove anything, including underwear, that is reasonably necessary for a medical examination to enable the person to be vaccinated. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to, it's it's almost inconceivable. That's, that's kind of one that boggles my mind, that, that's actually been written and that that's actually been put in place. So, um, yeah, well, I would be arguing that under some kind of human rights, that's for sure. Um, Bianca says, how are you aware of any mechanism to challenge a state of emergency? Definitely, well, I would be saying, I would be going to a lawyer and talking about who's, who's willing to take it on and talking about or taking on as a public abuse of process would be the basis I'd be doing it, that it's just a really blatant abuse of process. Um, so, yeah, human rights are set aside at the moment. Yeah, well, unfortunately, with martial law, they by and large are. And that's why when they bought martial law in England in, in 1665, and that was what Blackstone was referring to, that was when William Penn, was Bullman arrested and for, for basically preaching about Christ on the streets. And that was what brought in the Bill of Rights because the jury stood their ground and said, we're not 
got to submit to this draconian law. This is just one of those laws you just have to say, um, yeah, this is just straight out evil. You know, there's no way in hell I, I would submit, to, uh, you know, you submit to this. That's, that's how you got to handle something like that. Um, no other way, really. So let me... Yeah, I'll talk about financial um, wealth protection stuff in the Thursday webinar. So there's so many questions. I've lost them all in the chat. So please excuse me if I missed it. Ignore us. Katie, I nearly lost my son to vaccines four years ago. Yeah, you and many others. I've heard some horrendous stuff around that, that's for sure. Um, so what's the difference between legal, mandatory and compulsory? Um, I don't really know, I think. There probably is some difference, but not that I'm aware of that. Like I said, I'm I kind of go for what's really important here. And for me, it's going going for the remedies, like I'm saying. Um the other stuff I could share, like I said, really it's been two hours and um I mean there's so much more I could share and go through all this, but um let's just keep going through some of these questions. Um the hierarchy of applicable acts and what takes precedence from Connor. Um yeah, look, um, I know in WA, the constitution, for example, is all a WA state constitution is the main document. And that does, you know, have a lot of rights. And of course, they get, there's a couple of problems in WA as well. There seems to be, and Wayne Blue talks about this, they, they removed the crown or the queen and they put in the state, which effectively, the definition effectively links to a corporation. And I know they've changed all the land titles um, in many places to a corporate name. So it's not owned by the Crown anymore. So someone's stolen the land. So there's definitely a shitload of stuff that's gone on over the last 20 years in WA. Um, 2004, they did this thing. I don't know if anyone else has heard of that one, um, when basically everyone's property. So no one actually owns their properties here at all anymore. Um, but, you know, I don't want to shock you too much in one night, but some of you may already know that. Um, is a face mask and medical treatment? Yeah, so look, I'll, I'll go through that another time, Connor, on the hierarchy of acts, but basically the state constitution, I mean, the state of emergency is a kind of suspension or a martial law for emergencies. Are the police allowed to search you for ID without arresting you? Um, that's a good question. I don't really know. Um, my understanding is that, yeah, no, I don't actually know. I have to be honest on that one. I did make it up. Um, re good reference reading material for learning our rights. Um, I would start by actually reading um, government. What's a very good one? It's really basic and not completely relevant to Australia, but it just, it's a really interesting starting point I was given in the underground movement. Howard Freeman, the UCC Connection. He gives a fairly interesting perception that goes right back to common law and how it works. It's quite, it's quite brilliant. And it's, it's not all relevant, but it does give some idea. Um, so let me see. Is face mask a medical? Yeah, cryptocurrency protecting, yep, covering that one. Um, yep, Howard Freeman, the UCC connection, yep. Um, okay, what else? Yep, so that's a starting point. Um, how can we get more businesses on board? Can we invite them to this page? Yeah, look, definitely. I think that the, the moderators are more than happy to do that. Um, Lisa, I heard it won the maritime long game at the common law through Nasara. Oh, look. I'd love to be proven wrong. I think Nassar is a whole lot of shit myself. I really do. I think that's a deliberately planted conspiracy to actually get people distracted. I, I think that's a load of shit. But if I'm proven wrong, I will happily get on and say, well, I got that one wrong and I'm glad I did. So, yeah, I think that's a load of shit myself. Um, but if I'm wrong, I'll be very, that's one thing I would have no eat humble pie over any day of the week. Um, okay. I was approached today as I wasn't wearing a mask. I said I had a medical exemption. The police sent a text in the morning requesting me to upload my evidence. Where do I go this place? As you say, silence is content. One of the lessons I learned in law 
was never lied to governments, okay? But you just don't say what you don't have to do. Um, so, um, yeah, I personally am a little bit different to most. Like I said, like I just don't get asked to sign in. The couple of times the shop insisted, I just wrote my name on the thing. I wrote in messy writing, but I wrote it on there, you know? Yeah, good luck to him work, but I'm naturally a very messy writer anyway, and my family reckon I'm the worst writer they've seen. I'm worse than a doctor. So, yeah, I don't, it's one thing I learned from my lawyer mentor when I was was trained. Like, you don't ever lie because they can charge you with giving false evidence, and that's a very serious one. So I just don't lie, but I don't tell them anything they don't ask me, and I just keep to the facts, and I make sure they evidence everything I say. So that's my tip on that one. Um, you just... You know, the issue that you've got there is that what I'd be saying on that, you know, I can't give legal advice, obviously, but the best thing you can really do is say, is go back to the mandate and quote that one that you may wish to get it, but say, you know, I haven't, I haven't exercised that wish to go and get it because, you know, good luck seeing a doctor and it's a big process to get, to get that exemption, you know, even though it does, but read carefully through what the exemptions say. I'm sure one of them will fit you and look at the Queensland one and just write that out. That would be my evidence. That's what I'd be doing. Um, someone um, had the, can we discuss scanning and signing in? Um, yeah, so I don't personally, um, I don't, I, I write down manually. I don't use that app. Um, and like I said, I don't lie, but very few shops ask because most people really don't want you they don't really want to enforce it. I mean, most businesses, like, they just can't be bothered. I mean, they're not paid to basically be government agents, you know, working on behalf of the government. So they don't want to do it. They really don't. If you think about it, like, none of you would want to force it on people. So most business owners feel the same as you. You're fine. It's only the big stores like Stupid Dome and, you know, Bunnings and a few others that kind of get worked up. So I say take the opportunity to support small business. Like, stop giving these guys your business. Like, you know, starve the fuckers. That's that's what I say. Um, with places like that, just get find small businesses. That's why I like this awake perf business. Find businesses who are, you know, there's going to be other handy people other than Bunnings and support them. Um, find other, you know, shops that make coffee. I mean, don't make shit stuff anyway. Um, so that's um, support small business. Support the businesses on this group. You know, let everyone know what's going on and basically leave the big people to take their little their little you know patchy slaves and you know make them make them do what they want that's how i see it that's true sovereignty so yeah there's a register of small businesses absolutely and it's growing i'm telling you it's really growing you don't need to go to mcdonald's and i mean mcdonald's makes horrible food i mean god it's like how do you get sick in a minute um someone at the police called to medical center where one of our people wasn't wearing a mask they showed in the expedition. Um, look, the problem is I think everyone says it. That's the whole point, you know. And so you just got to read the mandate. Like that's what I'd be doing and show them the mandate and be, be very respectful and say, look, I appreciate you doing your job and you're protecting the state. That's what I'd say to them because, you know, thank you for protecting the state. I appreciate that. Um, just so you know, this is my understanding of the mandate. I'll explain what my situation is and why I'm claiming this one. Um Someone said that putting a sign up at their things about, um, you know, no one being able, um, I can't remember, it was quite a good question, but can can we put a sign up um, basically um, saying only, you know, certain things can happen. I can't remember, like people who hadn't had the therapy can come in or something like that, or, you know, no masks in the shop. Look, um, it's certainly worth, I mean, look, I, I don't know how governments would handle it. I really don't. I mean, whether there's an offence that says you can't be inciting someone to commit an offence, um, that's the only thing I would be mindful of. But in saying that, if everyone's doing it, um, yeah, people have the right with their shops, as I see it. So, but that's not legal advice, that one. That's a tough one because technically you got to do that because you really believe in it and know that there's a good chance, there's a possible chance that you might get talked about. Um, I was told W as a sovereign state by a judge. Is that true? Oh, depends what they mean by sovereign. Um, really? Okay, I managed to get through all the questions in that particular chat. 
Um, what is the right of a business to not see someone who's been vaccinated because gene therapy because of the transmission of the synthetic DNA as this an experiment? Well, I think I, I don't see any, but see, that's a different one. I don't see any reason why you can't do that. I mean, you can choose who comes in, who you can't. There's no mandate to have, um, have, the, have the, B, the B word. So if you want to not have anyone, because I have heard shedding is a real risk, and I always had this feeling that, that might be true. Um, Sally says, what about air travel? Do you see us being able to go overseas? Well, nothing is forever. I mean, at some stage, all this shit will be sorted out. But I think in the next little while, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging. So, um, yeah, I think you've got to realise in war, but in war, you've got to be in for the long haul. And the reason that they're winning the war is they know the art of patience. Whoever is behind this, they're patient. Not so much at the moment. It seems a bit more frantic than normal and pushing a bit harder. But the secret to winning a war is the one who's patient and waits it out will win. I won many legal battles because I was patient and I could wait it out. That was one of my strengths. I knew how to wait out battles and kind of, um, you know, psych people out. So the secret is here is to realise that, that with the overseas travel thing, it's going to sort out. It just... How long will it take? I don't know. And in what form it will come back? I don't know. But it will sort out. And so for now, focus on what you got ahead. I, I for one, am discovering the amazing Western Australia, you know, and what, it, I mean, there's so many great places in our state I wasn't even aware of. So, yeah, just that's why for me, it just, I just, one thing I've learned in war is you just got to literally take your, you got to, you got to take the cards you dealt with. And a lot of, and I think, and, and, and Buddha once said, um, the great, great Buddha, spiritual teacher, he said that suffering happens because people are attached to things and it's our expectations of, of, of it. So what causes suffering is that when you want the world to be a certain way and it's not, that's what causes suffering because it's not the how you should be. Suffering it might be because you don't have a soulmate that you really think you should have. So you get a suffering. Whereas bliss or nirvana in the Buddhist teaching, for example, is where you literally just hit that point of balance with all things. You just see it for what it is. So it just, it is what it is right now. It's just the fact is we've been a very lazy, complacent, rich society who's been, you know, completely lazy and spoiled by our greed and prosperity. Um, we've been environmentally irresponsible. We've used horrendous therapies. We've violated human rights. We've swindled in business. We've let crime go rampant. We've let governments get away with shit for years without making them accountable and we're now paying the price for it. It's that simple. And it's just taking the lessons from what's happened, seeing it for what it is and realising that, yeah, the reality is that a system's been set up where governments control all the plane and overseas travel and they can do this shit until, until you stand up, you know, and start to find alternative solutions and ways around it. So this is what I, and this is going to take time and process. I don't have all the answers tonight. You know, I really don't. So, um, yeah, collective karma. You know, it's just, I don't have all the answers, but I think we're making some real progress when you have groups like Awake Businesses in Perth coming together and where you have my Zoom webinar max out and everyone wants to actually hear me really just waffle on and share all this kind of stuff. And, you know, if anything, God, I mean, we could probably keep going, but I think as my business partner, Grace, who's on his night. She's actually um, my ex-wife, would you believe it? And we run these groups together and we hang out with best friends. So she's like, um, you know, so yeah, she's on here and kind of we take care of each other. So we just didn't work so well. We live in the same house. So, well, thank you, everyone. My battery's almost dying. I think that's a sign. And look, everyone, I'll see you on, Wednesday, on, on Thursday night at 7 o'clock at the Great Reset. Um, and really look forward to sharing that with you and helping you guys keep your money because, you know, prosperous prosperity and that is a really important time in me able to stand up and make a difference. So the recording is going to be on the Wake Business Group, um, Facebook group. So it's been live streamed to that as well as my personal page, which I now have a lot more new friends. So thank you, everyone. Lots of love. I'll see you all on Thursday.